The following is a conversation with Simon Hagler. I got to know Simon in 2009 when I started working in a startup company called Procedural Inc. that developed City Engine. Simon is one of the original core team that founded Procedural in 2007 and has been involved in the development of the tool since the very early academic prototype. Since the acquisition of Procedural by Esri in 2011, and uh, we'll hear quite a few things about this process in the episode, Simon is still working on CD Engine as a principal software engineer. Around 2012, CD Engine's heart that creates the 3D geometries called the Grammar Core and up to this point was hard-coded in CD Engine, was cut out and refactored into a standalone C++ library, which got renamed PRT, or Procedural Runtime. This step made it possible to use the procedural technology natively in a variety of other tools. PRT, of course, is since then also used by CD Engine itself. Around mid-2013, when PRT was born and ready to be used, Simon and I started to work together on a plugin for Houdini, which then later on was released under the name of Palladio, which is, of course, a reference to the Italian Renaissance architect Andrea Palladio. Since that time, I'm in regular contact with Simon, as a Durban were heavy users of both Palladio and City Engine. My time at Procedural and getting in contact with City Engine has had a massive impact on my career, and I would not be where I am without Simon's support, patience, shared love for 3D, but most importantly, also his friendship. Thank you, Simon, for everything over the years. It's an honor to have you as my guest in this episode. Stay humble, stay curious. This is the 3D Environment Podcast. And now, please enjoy the conversation with Simon Hagler. Well, it's a pleasure, Simon, to have you here on the podcast. Thank you. It's uh, also especially a pleasure because you came uh, to my office and we're recording in the basement where it's cool and, uh, yeah, not yeah, noise-free, kind of, right? Yeah, I like it um, here. <laughs> <laughs> Always wanted to see the famous Matt's basement recording studio. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's amazing. Thank you so much for doing this and for coming by. It's sure. fantastic. Uh, yeah, so uh, as always, I have prepped a few things and I'm curious to hear more. I mean, our history goes back quite some time, so I do know some of the things that I'm asking, but the audience doesn't know yet. So <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to be able to kind of, yeah, un unlock some of those secrets. Sure. <laughs> I hope I remember everything. It's been a, quite a ride. <laughs> ah, cool, cool. Yeah, I, I really hope that uh, kind of when going back in time, yeah, you will also kind of find some of those things again that you remember mm -hmm. uh, in the sense of the good old times. <laughs> so looking forward to that. Uh, yeah, but I would say please uh, have a little bit or take a little bit of time and uh, talk a little bit about your background and who you are and where you came from. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah. So yeah, my name is Simon Hagler. I'm uh, originally from around Basel, so not far away from here, as we are recording in Uster near Zurich. I uh, grew up in a little village called Lausen. It's basically on the on the train uh, from Basel to Zurich in the uh, Jura Mountains. And uh, yeah, I was then, uh, I did, uh, went, to, went to high school, was interested in maths and physics and all these kind of things. Was always riding my bicycle around town. Yeah. 
Typical to, Swiss. Yeah, yeah. Went to <laughs> went to Basel to go to go to the movies. You know, enjoyed my share of the Star Warses and Star Treks and all these nice sci-fi stuffs and all sorts of fantasy things. And then, yeah, I went to ETH Zurich uh, to study electrical engineering and information technology. I think we were the last to get the diploma and not. Actually, we got a diploma on the one side of the page and we got a master's on the other side of the mm -hmm. page. <laughs> and yeah, then um, I uh, was always interested in programming. So I early on started hacking on my dad's work computer. He was a, a physiotherapist. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. uh, he always was worried that I break his uh, kind of bookkeeping software because I <laughs> was trying out word art. <laughs> stuff like that and I learned you know Turbo Pascal at the time and then the Borland Pascals and at some point I learned all the other languages uh, basic and C++ and stuff so I was early on interested in pro programming and also graphics I guess that's mm -hmm. a big part which brings me here right yeah this will come up I think <laughs> once or twice afterwards I remember doing line drawing manual raster graphics with I don't know, one frame per minute, <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> Completely naive stuff. Yeah, I think I remember actually I programmed my, programmed a little app to learn French vocabulary because I oh. I was so not motivated to learn French. Uh, I am now, but it's a bit late. <laughs> 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 yeah, things like that. And then at the home, at a great time. Yeah, I loved physics again, you know, lasers, you know, electrical engineer and uh, also microelectronics. But somehow then I ended up in the graphics. I, mm -hmm. And uh, that's how I met Pascal Muller, actually. I mm -hmm. had to choose a master thesis and I randomly walked by his office and saw the sign. He was looking for a procedural modeling topic or he had a procedural modeling topic. And I was like, yeah, let's check this out. Nice. I see. I see. So let me dig down a little bit deeper into the programming side and kind of going from electrical engineering towards programming in general or more, let's say, computer graphics. Mm -hmm. How would you describe basically the difference in, I mean, electrical engineering also has a, or had back then a lot of programming aspects, right? Potentially more programming hardware and so on, but the switch of going from programming in electronics or electronical engineering things to switch to computer graphics. How did this switch kind of happen? How did you get in contact with this other world? I mean, it's not even that big of an other world or that much different because what I liked about, I mean, there is the informatic guys at ETH and there's the electrical engineers. So mm -hmm. Both have mm -hmm. a lot of programming lectures and exercises and things like that. What I liked about the electrical engineering side, it was much more hands-on mm -hmm. guys at the informatics department. They do a lot of theoretical stuff, you know, proof that an algorithm runs in X amount of times. Yeah, yeah. And we were always very hands-on, you know, programming hardware. I mean, not you could go down to VHDL, right? Actually describing hardware like mm -hmm. chip logic um, gates. That was not really my jam. I tried it a bit, but I really liked to do, you know, application development uh, in Java at the beginning. We, yeah. we literally had had uh, lectures using Java as to learn data structures, to learn algorithm. And some of these exercises involved, you know, graphics already, shapes, simple OpenGL stuff. I see. Yeah. 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 And I always liked that. I, I also did a lot of in my spare time, you know, I played with 3ds Max. I played with very early Blender on a Unix machines yeah. back then. Yeah. Nice. Blender 1. <laughs> oh. Or 0 0.9. But then also some of those lectures, I mean, because ETH is... It's a big university, but obviously sometimes also certain lectures are shared between departments. Was this the case in your case? Yep. Informatics, computer science per se, having the same lectures as electrical engineering, which would obviously tie the different disciplines together naturally. Coming from the electrical engineering department, you could actually choose to visit lectures at the computer science department. 
And yeah. so they was very interested to hear uh, the lectures from Markus Groß, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and his colleagues or his postdocs. There was a lot of nice computer graphics lectures. And that, that kind of brought me there. I really learned about, you know, mesh data structures, subdivision surfaces, all these kind of <laughs> mathematical nice stuff. Yeah. Mathematical ways of describing surfaces, explicit, implicit. And then, uh, yeah, that's really, but I guess kind of led the way then that I, I went for a master thesis in, in this uh, topic. More in graphics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there something in specific that decided, hey, my future is more in, in graphics than electrical engineering, or was it more like a, like a natural progress? I think it was pretty organic, to be honest. I'm, I, I'm always an, kind of an organic guy. I just, I do what feels right at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't have like this 20 year master plan. Yeah. It's not really my way. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I should also add that the electrical department, for some historic reason, has a big sub department called computer vision or uh, yeah, computer vision laboratory. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. German, it's called Bildwissenschaften, BV. Yeah. It was called. Yeah. And there, there was where these two worlds kind of merged. And I mean, yeah, you have also the robotics coming in from the other side where the computer science, the electrical engineering and the computer vision algorithms are all packed into one device usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, that, that makes absolute mm. sense. What was Pascal's role? So for those who don't know which Pascal is, we're, we're talking about Pascal Miller, who was also, uh, we'll, we'll talk about more about City Engine, but he was like the original author of, of City Engine at the, when it was still an academic prototype. And I think the first screenshot I saw that he showed me years ago, that was from 1999. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so basically we're kind of slowly moving in the direction of, mm -hmm. of talking about City Engine, right? But um, I'm curious then, how did this happen that you you met Pascal? In which role was he that, or in which chair was he working where he was basically kind of you mentioned that he had a, an open master's degree position yeah. for that. Yeah. What was his role back then? Uh, I think when I met him, he was he had started his PhD maybe one year in. I don't know really. And he was under the supervision of Professor Luc Fangol, a very famous professor in computer vision. Yeah. He was doing his, his PhD on uh, basically procedural modeling. Uh, one of the main applications was archaeology. That was where I think he, most of his grant money came from to reconstruct um, Greek temples and yeah. archaeological mm -hmm. sites, kind of filling in where things were broken, yeah. Yeah. where there was missing survey data. And he devised uh, two master theses when my friend Andreas and myself uh, were looking for projects. So one was about landscaping, doing procedural algorithms and describing gardens and parks and Ooh, distributing yeah, 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 yeah. ponds and yeah. trees. And so that was Andy's uh, work. And I got the task or chose the task to kind of extend what Pascal had. He had basically had a language to describe building volumes. And he also did the street network algorithms in, in early works, I think in his own master thesis. And I then added facade details. Nice. So I was tasked with creating a language or a syntax to describe, uh, you know, facade floor rhythms and patterns. That's where we came up with the splits and the repeats and the so extrudes. That's the shape grammar. That was, yeah, at the, at the time when I was done with my thesis, we had two languages. We had one language to describe the volumes. And then we had kind of a handover to the language I helped develop to um, describe FASA patterns. So my language was more like doing a 2D uh, mosaic, and then we added the 3D assets in there. Yeah, yeah. You know, the window sills and the cornerstones and the, the roof tiles and all this stuff. And Pascal then went on later on in, towards the end of his PhD and kind of merged all of that into one language. Yeah. Which uh, a couple of years later, we completely re-implemented into the, the commercial product, City Engine. Yeah. 
Let's talk a little bit about City Engine for those that don't know it in its vision what it was supposed to do originally uh, maybe also the, the change from the academic prototype that you guys were involved with with the vision that then switched into the commercial let's say vanilla product that got released afterwards because knowing what city engine is really is fundamental for probably also understanding a little bit of the rest of, of mm -hmm. this episode so let's maybe describe the state of what it is today, so people understand what we do today. So the engine is basically an, an application which helps you to lay out street networks of cities, then derive parcels and parks and blocks from them, and then derive building shapes, do massing, um, kind of, you know, also with, with, with the numbers, basically, you want to say a neighborhood should have this and this many floor square meters or this and this many apartments with this and this much space for people. And so it's basically an urban planning or geo design app. And we kind of facilitate that by having uh, this tool called procedural modeling, which helps you, for example, adapt building shapes and facade details to a changed street network. So if you change a street, you don't want to go in and manually um, recreate all the buildings, which now have maybe more or less space available. But our language will allow you to do that automatically, basically. And this was not really, or not not only while when we started this. I mean, I, I don't want to speak for Pascal in the very early times, right? Mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. but when I joined the team or joined him, it was all about computer, you know, um, movies, <laughs> special effects, VFX, Blade Runner. You know, yeah, yeah. the first Blade Runner was very much an inspiration for all of us. All these movies where you have kind of dystopian uh, sci-fi, <laughs> uh, huge buildings, total recall, all this kind of stuff. Which is funny because now I'm very much interested in not building dystopian cities. <laughs> and I really hope our users use our software to build nice neighborhoods and kind of yeah. study architectural interventions, you know, where to place bus lines, where to place trams, bicycle routes, and not your next uh, six lane highway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's how, where we came from. So we had this pivot, I guess. I mean, it was not really a pivot. This one was more like an organic change. We, we had to survive as a startup at some point and we had to painfully realize it's not games and movies. It's more like, in our case, GIS, architectural visualization, mm -hmm. urban planning, mm -hmm. as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. That's how we could make uh, some profit and survive and eventually join Esri, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's another topic yeah. we're probably going to well, talk about. Yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, the the first description that I heard, I don't know who told me that, but the uh, kind of originally the idea that Pascal had that inspired him to create his master's uh, thesis was optimizing the production and design of, I think, industrial buildings, in the sense of uh, more like. A, configuration and optimizing the design because it's very kind of following a lot of patterns. So in the sense of more a design aspect of or kind of planning, but I'm not perfectly sure anymore. But this then kind of the idea got extended into procedurally modeling architecture per se. And I think the basic idea about the whole thing is to start programming the creation or the mm -hmm. modeling of the geometries. Maybe I should explain a bit more how this concept works. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's all about capturing the architectural patterns and proportions in computer code in a language so that you can then kind of change the, let's say, overall space uh, building has, but then the internal proportions will remain true because I guess I'm not an architect myself, but I, over the years, I learned that there's some key proportions in an architectural design, which makes it unique, which makes yeah. you recognize a certain style of architecture or maybe also ornamentation, of course, and stuff like that. But Overall, it's probably the, the proportions, I guess. You, Matt, are the expert here <laughs> <laughs> about that. And so this is what we try to capture so that you, when you make a, let's say you make a facade wider, you will add windows in the proper amount if there's enough space or you 
change the space between the windows, depending on how much space you have. So it's kind of this uh, magic rubber band behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just basically, yeah, the, one of the best analogies I usually heard, or I I had to use back then when I was working in the City Engine team, when giving demos to people that to explain about how this stuff works is basically, you're writing down your recipe in can computer code that basically teach the computer how to cook. Mm -hmm. But then if you have to cook 100,000 meals, you just let the computer do the grunt work, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in this collaboration together with uh, Andy and uh, Pascal over time, this kind of, you guys, it, it felt like you guys are starting some sort of movement. You had a, a big impact on the academic side also. You are one of the co-authors of this seminal 2006 SIGGRAPH paper called Procedural Modeling of Buildings which was or in this field of kind of the automation of the creation of architectures of procedural modeling in general in computer graphics this paper was revolutionary and was really really well received in computer graphics side of things so one of the most famous conferences is obviously siggraph and so i, I just noted down this name here that's the amc which is the Association for Computing Machinery. So I'm not perfectly sure about their role specifically, but they are collecting some of those uh, SIGGRAPH papers, are probably uh, like the, the body, the, the organizational body behind judging all of those papers and so on that are shown at SIGGRAPH and discussed at SIGGRAPH. So SIGGRAPH has been around for 50 years now. And after 25 years, and now uh, that was in... Uh, I believe 1998, and then again in 2023, uh, so last year basically, there was a second volume. So kind of after 25 years and then after another 25 years, there were two books published basically by the ACM. And your paper, this seminal paper, was basically part of that second volume, which is, I believe, one of 50 papers. I'm not sure how many papers are going into this volume. But I mean that's that's a monumental achievement of uh, success in the ac academic realm of being able to be an author or a co-author of such a paper. So massive kudos, obviously. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And just to, I, I think this is really really important to underline what this means. And I, I just wanted to dig down a little bit on how did this feel back then? Did you guys anticipate at all what? this idea could move, basically, or what an impact it could have. To be honest, I, I do not really know that it would have such a long-lasting career-spanning outcome. I'm super happy that it, it has, of course. Back then, I was just truly just fascinated by that we had this little thing, this kind of, um, you know, academic uh, thing called shape grammars, you know, the or L system and all these algorithms. You basically just iteratively replace elements. I was just fascinated that you can, out of simple rules, create complex emergent behavior. There's sometimes also randomness involved, and it's just fascinating to play around, and you get all these fractal-like shapes, you know. Game of life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was also playing around a lot with fractals, you know, Mandelbrot sets <laughs> and yeah. Julia sets and all this stuff. So... Back then, I was just fascinated how, how it fit to architecture. It was just kind of clicking in place, especially for facades, you know, for not too organic designs, you know. We're not talking Hundertwasser or something like that. <laughs> but it was just cool to see, um, for, if, especially when, when Pascal came up with, with the idea to recreate old Greek architecture, mm. you know, the temples and the Ionic uh, capitals and... Uh, the Doric ones, Doric the and Corinthian Ion ones. I no, Ionic. Uh, Ionian, I believe is the correct word. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And it just worked, you know. And so that when I was just, I was, yeah, I was fascinated. And I, we, you know, added step by step. We added feature. We thought about what, what happens if two windowsills, you know, meet at a corner of the building. 
what should happen, what is architecturally right, yeah. and stuff like that. So we started to cut apart assets and then more and more computer graphics algorithm we had to use to cut apart geometry. There was some really hard problems. We sometimes solved very pragmatically <laughs> to <laughs> not spend three years doing crazy Boolean CSG <laughs> yeah. uh, graphic stuff, which <laughs> ironically we are doing now. <laughs> Goes comes full circle. And then um, we, we had a lot of success. I think we were at the right time with this paper. There was a lot of procedural modeling going on at this period and of the, how you say, zero years. <laughs> yeah, end of 2006, 2010. And there's also our, our good colleague, Peter Wonka, who did a lot of uh, research papers, kind of also doing, you know, reverse procedural modeling, trying to figure out the rules of a building from a capture geometry or even from pictures so we have also computer vision coming in again yeah yeah of course these days it, this is our all um, neural networks deep learning ai as they say <laughs> yeah i saw just in a in your newsletter he just a couple of days ago i think he released another paper yeah it's now in the kind of spatial arrangement of interiors in the mm. sense of yeah it's heavily computer vision oriented but uh, with the relationship of objects in a space in relation to each other but yeah obviously this is highly connected uh, to architecture I'm, I'm quite removed from research these days i'm really very hands-on application developer these days but it kind of is very important to for a lot of use cases to understand the structure of a scene, especially for robots or even for on the city level, right? You want to fly over the city, understand where all the buildings are, then you can take them out, replace them with new designs. And I mean, there's myriads of applications which are relying on understanding a scene, doing proper segmentation, classification, yeah, yeah, yeah. labeling, yeah. Yes. Autonomous driving is another example. You need to know which are the signs, which are the trees, which are the people <laughs> or the cars. <laughs> Avoid the people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So coming back to your question, uh, I think we just, we literally just had fun. That was, uh, that was one of the key parts. We, we functioned well as a team. We yeah. had some similar interests, some um, similar cultural interests, and we were just, you know, graphic geeks and spend uh, nights, uh, you know, running all the computers in the computer lab of the, at uni to render some uh, archaeological reconstruction of Pompeii. And when not DJing with core bounds, right? I was not part of core bounds. Ah, yeah. oh, you were that, not part? No. Yeah, all I was, right. I was just joining the party on the dance floor. <laughs> 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 Let the guys work. <laughs> Doing visuals, yeah. yeah. There's some nice anecdote. Years later, so we always had this problem that all our computers would run out of memory when we were trying to render a particular uh, recreation of Pompeii. We had this really r nicely detailed roof tiles. Years later, we figured out that all the polygons were, by mistake, duplicate. And so we used twice the amount of memory <laughs> which we could have or which we should have. So... That's funny how it works sometimes, but <laughs> I think the magical part or the lesson learned sometimes is you just have to make it work regardless the technical niceties or hurdles yeah, yeah. and get there to an 80% solution. And I think that's also a bit of a quality we have, kind of knowing where, where to stop or what the essential functions. There's always one million things I would like to have more in our apps, but you're only a small team still, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's one of the, yeah, the, the biggest challenges in, in general, you, you cannot have it all, right? Yeah, so after that, after your master's degree, then eventually you also decided to uh, pursue a PhD. And I do remember you were, when I was working at Procedural, I started 2009. So during that time, you were still kind of fully immersed in the PhD. And I don't remember precisely what the, kind of what the topic was about. I just remember that you were hacking away in CUDA, trying to, I believe you were kind of trying to implement uh, like a parallelized version of CGA, that shape grammar on, on the GPU. But probably this was just 
for one specific paper in the context of your PhD. But what was the topic about in, in general? When I was done with the master's, I got the offer to stay at the department and mm -hmm. uh, continue working on residual modeling problems. I got the task of dealing with the uh, level of detail for buildings. So back then, the amount of data was enormous for computation, yeah. especially yeah. to display, yeah. visualize it. Yeah. So we tried to, you know, you have a fully detailed building you might get from a LiDAR scan survey, something you reconstructed very detailed, but then it gets too heavy to use in real-time applications. Yeah. So naturally you want to, if you, for example, um, have more distance with the camera, you want to simplify the geometry because if you have one pixel, if the building has the size of a pixel, you want to maybe render one polygon and not 200,000. Yeah. Yeah. or 20,000 points. And so th that was my task, but I also, that was the overall idea. I also got tracked or <laughs> had the fortune to join some archaeological reconstruction projects, um, some European research projects. Uh, yeah, and the, the, the thing you mentioned was about another kind of level of detail. The idea was to only actually create or render the facade if you can see it or if you um, how should I say, you you basically ask the camera, how much of myself do you see? So yep. imagine I'm yep. the facade. Yeah. Ask how much, and the camera tells me, I, I will see 20 pixels. So I can actually, at this time, then execute the procedural algorithm, the procedural recipe of the facade, and only construct the elements which are actually necessary for that resolution and point of view. And so the idea was to, in real time, create the building geometry. So you actually have an empty, you have an empty facade, and at the render time you create. I mean, you're, from what I know, you're still now and then playing with these things like uh, Hydra and so on, right? Yeah, I mean, it's the same. <laughs> the, sa the concept is not new and yeah. has been around for ages in RenderMan from Pixar. Yeah, yeah. they call it. Uh, they think they called it DSOs. You could actually tell the renderer if you hit this box, if or if your ray out of the eye of the camera hits this box in the scene, only then start to load or create some geometry. This helped them save a lot of memory for for the early, you know, Toy Stories and yeah, this kind of yeah, movies. Yeah. Yeah. And this, so we had kind of the same idea, but on the GPU in my case, uh, in for real time applications, directly evaluate the building recipe. When also only generated when you re really need it, so you don't have to load in all the polygons beforehand. That was the idea. Yeah, yeah. I just remember there was also a part of, I'm not sure if, it, if this was related to this paper or to some other research that I know you were involved in based on some of the chats we had back then. Basically taking, for example, or also as an, a different type of approach for creating LODs in approximating a given volume, let's say from a LiDAR scan, and then basically permutate over many, many procedural representation of the volume until you have a quote unquote best fit for the volume based on kind of the, the silhouette. Is that true or I'm mixing up something? No, that's something I spend a lot of time and then never really succeeded to get this running to kind of learn and I guess that's the keyword here. I tried to do something which is now called machine learning and neural uh -huh. ne deep yeah. learning. Yeah. I tried to do it the hard way by trying to brute force or gradient descent, you know, one of these yeah. global yeah. optimization yeah. search yeah. algorithms, finding shapes which would approximate a building, a highly detailed building yeah. approximated with shapes and yeah, I got stuck there, unfortunately, and this, this was also some of the reasons I got stuck with the whole PhD itself. And uh, just for the record's sake, I didn't, at some point I had to took the hard decision to join the startup fully, and kind of switch away from academics and so kind that of was ab procedural abandoned, yeah, yeah, abandoned yeah, yeah, the PhD, yeah, 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 yeah. which I don't really, I don't really regret it. Um, I was always more of the hands-on kind of engineer type and yeah, yeah, it was a very nice, and it was an honor to be part of that academic part. And I'm also very grateful to Luke Fungol, give me the opportunity mm. to join mm. these European mm. projects. Mm. We had really some good times there. Maybe can add a little aside. One of the really nice projects was called Cyberwalk, 
And we were just, you know, using our standard reconstructions of, you know, Pompeii and maybe Rome and things mm. like that. <laughs> But the reason I bring up this um, research project was the, the absolutely monstrous machines our colleagues at, in Munich built. They built a two-dimensional treadmill. So a treadmill, right? Mm -hmm. You have to imagine a treadmill out of treadmills. So you had like wow. treadmills, many little treadmills going in the, let's say, X direction. Yeah. Then these formed together a big treadmill themselves going in Y direction or set direction yeah, in, yeah, the, in yeah. the plane. And then you could walk and both of the systems would would keep you back in the center and you could walk on that. This is it, crazy. It weighed 10 tons. It made a noise like an airplane. And it, But you had a head-mounted display on mm -hmm. with, with CD mm -hmm. Engine generated procedural modeling Pompeii scenes or some other scenes. And I was just, I'm very grateful for this experience because I will never forget this machine. <laughs> and how dangerous it wow. was. Wow. <laughs> so, so yeah. But in the end, I was, I took the right decision in hindsight and went full on to help the startup, mm. you know, mm. even crazier amount of hours uh, <laughs> bringing City Engine reinvented to the market. Yeah. I mean, that that's also one of those things that was like completely blowing my mind. When I heard that you guys basically from I don't know whichever the state was of the let's say the code base that you had of CD Engine to go from that to the first releasable public version, kind of bringing everything into uh, what was the framework again called the programming framework uh, Eclipse. We use Eclipse, yeah. Yeah. That was... to, to bring that in and basically be able to release was about three months. That's a kind of the or somehow. I heard this number like a, a couple of months. I think it might be, oh, this is now really in the depths of time. I th this might have been, I think we started 2007-ish, end of 2007, and first public version was 2008, March, April, something like that. So a good year, I would give it a good year. A year. Yeah. I, I just got this information in my head somehow that it was something like three months. We were maybe, quick. I don't know. Maybe. We were pretty quick yeah. to market. That's I think that's true. It was also very unstable at the beginning, you know, it's famous war stories. Our first demo at FMX in Stuttgart, you know, you had to click the exact correct order of buttons, otherwise it would just vanish <laughs> and, on the stage. And these were the, the times where the demos were expected to be live still, right? No, I mean, we always do live demos to, until today, basically. Yeah, I, sh I really would like to give a shout out here to Simon Schubiger and Matthias Specht. Simon joined us as CTO mm -hmm. and Matthias as the lead developer. And they were their pragmatism and decisions really made us fly from the start. Mm -hmm. Of course, with the leadership of Pascal and also Dominic Taroli on the business side. We took some decisions which I regret now, that we certain technological decisions. But without those, we would never have been so quick to the market. Yeah. We were able to use some, you know, prior technology. We didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. And some of this, yeah, legacy we still have to deal with today. That's the downside, right? Yeah. But um, yeah, again, I believe the user in the end doesn't really care which tech you use, yeah. as long as it feels snappy. This is my my personal pet beef. Apps never must lag the UX. <laughs> and, uh, please don't call in. I know it's uh, not perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll, we'll get there eventually. Mm. Well, also, super cool. Thanks for those things. We'll probably afterwards get get a little bit back to those times. Sweet. Yeah, but then let's actually kind of switch a little bit into your professional work life. And so, mm -hmm. at the moment, what's what's your current role? at Esri, and what is it that Esri actually does? Uh, just maybe also as a quick little refresher since episode seven, where Tasha was my guest that works pretty much in the, the same team or in the same office and so on, slightly different role. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, how, how did this basically happen from kind of going from procedural to Esri? So we, at some point as a startup, you need to figure out how to make an exit. Um, mm -hmm. Either you 
grow nicely and you can really grow from startup to small business to large business or let's say to sustainable yeah, business, yeah. depending on your wishes. We had to realize that we are just like hovering around the the zero line. We were we were not making big gains. We had to get some help, you know. Need we need bigger guns basically. And there was multiple things. Game industry, as I mentioned, uh, VFX animation. Um, we had to realize that in the long term there was a bit of a risk of being, you know, just shelved or our IP being copied into something else or in the worst case abandoned yeah and so we had uh, this nice uh, offer from Esri we met president Jack Dangermond so it's a privately held company it's not publicly traded which makes it uh, less nervous than publicly mm. traded mm. companies and not so many cooks trying to steer the boat <laughs> A lot of meta metaphors here, <laughs> and um, and there we really had a very good feeling. Um, Jack had a lot, gave us a lot of trust. Uh, we were able to stay together as a team. Yeah, we were basically converted from a startup into a research R and D department, yeah. uh, heavily on the D and a small small amount on the R, <laughs> because we had to basically teach Esri how to do three D. Mm -hmm. That was the key thing. They were looking for expertise. Uh, Esri is kind of a, the big old mothership. They uh, are, or we are, the kind of the world's leader in geographic information systems. So everything kind of where you have data which needs to be located on the planet, or these days also on other planets, <laughs> <laughs> Moon and Mars. And so it's all about the science of, we call it actually the science of where, that's the, the tagline, the, the slogan. And it's about algorithms, which yeah, how you how to describe you know terrains, how to describe geographic features, how to place man-made objects on the earth. You know, as with my background, obviously the buildings and the traffic signs and the, the streets themselves. But a lot of our customers have much different, much broader applications. For example, uh, utility networks, where's the mm -hmm. gas line, where's the big water mains. But it's also about, for example, counting biodiversity, which fish is where roughly or which species of trees. All this data needs to be stored in databases. It needs to be queried, needs to be clustered and you know, also in, in time, you know, time series. That's really Esri's core business, along with the map making back in the day. Mm -hmm. We have a strong suit of software, which is used to create analog and digital maps. We have our offering, uh, it's called ArcGIS Online, which is similar to Google Maps in a way. But our focus is more on business customers who then put their own data. Mm -hmm. We call them layers. Mm -hmm. um, layers have different data types, points, lines, polygons, 3D shapes, full on 3D assets with PBR shading these days. That's all. And this is the knowledge we brought in. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe I should mention also that, so shortly before we joined Esri, we started to develop other products than just City Engine. We started to go into web technology to have uh, kind of 3D scenes in the browser. That's 2010 or so was uh, when uh, WebGL more or less WebGL just was pretty much a revolutionary technology back then. Yeah, basically OpenGL in the browser, yeah. a subset yeah, yeah, of yeah. OpenGL. And this was really handy because you then could deliver 3D scenes to the user without they have to know how to open uh, what, a, what a, you know, what a FBX file is or what a yeah. OBJ yeah. file is back yeah. then. Yeah. All this file man manipulation was removed and they could just browse to a site and they had basically a 3D city in front of them. And so we, we developed an export from ZD Engine to such web scenes. I think it was called the City Engine Scene Viewer very early on. I'm seeing Scene Viewer. Yeah. yeah. And this still lives yeah. today. Esri has yeah. its own yeah. format. Yeah. They are now called Web Scenes with full on support for all the data layers. And now we start to add real full on editing capabilities. So yeah. for many tasks, you don't even need to leave the browser these days. You can really edit scenes. So that's that was kind of the second thing we, we brought to the table. 
that's why we were interesting to Esri to check yeah, as, a, as an acquisition. Yeah. And I'm very grateful to check that to date uh, he kept the band together. And Yeah, I remember, I mean, I, I was not one of the, the, the founding members. I was just working there, but I obviously I, I was kind of also part of the team going through that acquisition. So I, I heard a lot about the things. And one of the things that I believe are also one of those pillars or fundamental things that, that I was deeply in, impressed with you guys or procedural the founders is that you guys basically said, if we are going through with an exit or sell the company to another company, that there's this fundamental decision that we want to be able to stay together as a team. Because we have so many shared friends, we have so many like the families know each other. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be kind of ripped apart and then the technology gets filled in somewhere and people are mandated to be, you have to fly to the US or you have to relocate to, to the US and mm -hmm, so on. Mm -hmm. So basically this statement of, hey, we want to go, but kind of a little bit on also with our terms. It's not just we want to just do this exit, but there, there are also some some terms. And this beautiful gesture, basically, that Esri said, yeah, we're going to do this and actually convert you guys into an R&D center that stays in Zurich and doesn't go kind of to the headquarter in California. So this is something that I found beautiful as a business deal from both sides. And I found this is a huge amount of respect also for the people that are bold enough to state such a condition, but also on the other hand, for people that see the value in, in uh, kind of, if they keep that promise where the value really is. So this is something that is really important, uh, or I found this was one of the most important things for me back then, living through that phase with you guys. Now, on the other hand, there is this little detail that uh, also is important but plays a role is why are big tech giants even opening up R&D centers or business locations in certain cities in the world? And one, it's a, maybe it's a detail, but I think it's a fundamental detail. It's really important. You just mentioned you, were, uh, you and a lot of the guys of the City Engine team were graduating at ETH in Zurich, which is one of the top. 20 if, or top 100 you, technically university, universities worldwide. So a lot of very large companies actually open up subsidiary locations or R&D centers or whatever it is actually very close to those technical universities because they get access to talent, to the best PhDs, to the best uh, programmers and uh, people that have a master's degree or whatever because of the, these ties to a local university. And so Esri kind of moving in and kind of swooping in or, and, and getting a procedural as a startup with a highly motivated team and also kind of doubling down on opening a location very close to ETH is kind of a little bit of a win-win for everybody, right? So this aspect is also certainly some, uh, mm -hmm. like an important little detail why there's now... Uh, all the large tech companies like Meta, Esri, Microsoft, uh, and and so on, they all have some, a little bit of a foot in, in in Zurich, right? Which also plays a little bit mm -hmm, into mm -hmm. into this also. Yeah, so basically you, you guys got acquired by Esri and now in your current role at Esri, how did this, let's say, change over the over the years? What are your responsibilities at, at the moment? So um, at the moment, my role is principal software developer in the City Engine product team. I'm mostly responsible for, we call it, we have this thing called the driver role. So we kind mm -hmm. of split up to kind of the senior member of the team into drivers for certain stories, products, features we want to develop. These are usually one or two years long. So I'm currently working on Certain UI improvements we'll introduce uh, in a, a material browser, you know, just visually selecting materials. I'm working on a Python API for City Engine, which is important for many customers to yeah, yeah, yeah. automate Whee! and and unlock <laughs> and unlock features. I know you, you guys at, at Verben are heavy user of automation. Uh, so batch processing is uh, important to many people. I just know that I think Esri Netherlands once they split up the country in tiles and run billions of features mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. through CD Engine. And I'm also doing a lot of work of import-export. It might sound boring, you know, form and conversion, but it's over the years, it's amazing how important this part is. Getting data from other apps into CD Engine and vice versa is, is so important because that's where the value is in the daily business. Then I'm also working on, on plugins. I guess we'll we'll cover those in, in a minute as well. What I mean with that is basically CD Engine consists of different parts. And one part is the thing we, we started our conversation with, with, which is the procedural modeling engine. And uh, Matt knows very well, or you know very well that this also can be embedded in other apps to kind of execute our building or architectural recipes directly in other apps like uh, Rhino for the architects out there or 3ds Max for the gamers, <laughs> Maya for the animation and VFX people. And by by running uh, our technology directly in these other apps, you kind of cut away this import export, export import step, save time. You can interact more closely with other features of these apps. And this is also something I oversee. I have a few skilled colleagues who uh, help me develop these plugins. And I'm also doing a fair bit of innovation and R&D in general, kind of trying to figure out what could be done in two or three years down the line. New features, uh, rethinking how the app works, also helping uh, bring our technology into into other Esri products. Um, Some of the listeners might know ArcGIS Pro, kind of the the big mothership of GIS uh, of Esri. And we have a lot of our technology from CD Engine also ported into ArcGIS Pro over the years. We call this, for example, um, procedural symbols. Uh, symbols are in GIS speak or in map speak are basically features, let's say a tree, something which is located with a point on a, on a map. An object, with, an a, object with, a, yeah. uh, with the coordinates. And so our tech helps that you can load all kinds of 3D objects geographically correct on a map. Yeah, and uh, manage it in a, in a database and convert it on the fly for different visualization pipelines. So yeah, so that's kind of my role. I'm, 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 I think over the years I've been everywhere <laughs> in CD Engine, all over, all the over map. the place. Yeah. But up, sh- <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> all over the scene. <laughs> <laughs> wow! If you speak uh, 3D, <laughs> that's an insider now. <laughs> and yeah, and so. And I guess you asked uh, how my role changed. It funnily for me personally, it didn't change so much. Um, what's great is we have more resources to play with. Of course, we have. Uh, mm-hmm. I was also traditionally looking after the our internal services to build our software, to test it, to deploy it, ship it, and this was great. Joining S3, we got much more compute and IT resources. We were able to hire some great colleagues, uh, which are really experts in continuous, you know, integration, uh, virtual machine management, basically the full on sysadmin tool set. Is William still there? William? He was one of the very first guy I remember that that was kind of supporting you on the DevOps side. He came from California. uh, We had some great uh, visitors from the headquarters of Esri in LA to help us setting up our little office here and started with some cupboards full of computers. (laughs) And now we have uh, almost everything now is in the data center in spread over the world. (laughs) Yeah. Don't have much left here in Zurich, but I think William is still there. Yeah, I, I didn't talk to him for a long time. So uh, unfortunately, yeah, sometimes you lose track of people. <laughs> you, you meet new colleagues based on your daily yeah, requirements. Yeah. Ezra is big, a couple thousand people, and uh, it's a massive hundreds, company. hundreds Privately of developers. Held, right? yeah. yeah, so um, it's sometimes hard to track people. So I was lucky, and uh, my role. I was really able to focus uh, more and more even on on developing software, developing our desktop apps and uh, got some, yeah, got some great support. Of course, we got some great uh, help, you know, marketing, sales, business development. This was where the acquisition really was helping. Um, The market research. um, And we were able to reach much more users because Esri had millions of users or has millions of users. 
and uh, all the big capitals and cities are using Esri systems to urban planning to do general GIS, of course. And we are now able to tap this potential with our little contribution here from from Zurich. Oh, a little, <laughs> and it's been uh, just it's been thirteen years, right? Twenty eleven. 2024. This yeah, I'm going to have my 13th work anniversary for Esri in November <laughs> this it's, year. It's crazy. It's crazy how time is flying. Yeah. So you're yeah, a little bit all over the all over the place. But I, w- I want to go back a- again a little bit in in time and uh, talk about your internship at Weta. Mm-hmm. Something completely different film industry, right? How did this happen? Um, because, I mean, you mentioned the FBXs and the file import, file export, the, th- the different 3D tools. You have written, I would say, probably most of the code for the exporters for a very long time for City Engine. Uh, also, can, or the encoders and PRT context, and obviously also the importers. I don't know how many... Uh, unit tests there are for all of this <laughs> stuff right I, I don't want to ask how many there are meanwhile but i was i remember those that uh was some of them from back in the day like colada transparency and, and all of that stuff the horror stories, fun times yeah. <laughs> but but yeah i mean this internship how did this happen how did uh, did you get introduced to that and how did it influence your work i mean lord of the rings right I was, of course, as students, we were all fascinated by the works of Peter Jackson and Veta. And of course, we were all watching all the making offs and yeah, all yeah. the things. <laughs> and I mean, while Lord of the Rings obviously does not have any modern architecture and stuff like that, there were still a lot of fascinating glimpses into, you know, production techniques Tools like Massive, you know, was invented there, agent-based uh, crowd simulation. Um, Mari, uh, the, yeah. the paint tools, yeah. the, I forget, the UDIM-based uh, painting tools where you paint directly on polygons and um, some other stuff I forgot. So I, this was, I was really fascinated by how these guys pragmatically created tools to solve a specific task. Sometimes they even develop tools for one movie and they throw it away again. Yeah. But uh, the big things stuck, as, as I just mentioned, Murray and Co. Massive. And so I, at, at some point, when I was still still trying to do my PhD, I came across, I was, of course, following the beta news and the websites. And at some point, I just saw we look for interns, basically. Mm. And I just mm-hmm. uh, submitted my, my application and uh, had a little phone interview. I told them what I was doing and they were like, oh, yeah, yeah that could be in a, a fit maybe for our R&D sen- department, which they dissolved a couple of years later. Um, mm-hmm. When I was there, it was led by Sebastian Sylvan. Um, I, think so. I think he was with Autodesk b- before oh, he joined. It kind of ring, uh, rings a bell, but I'm not sure. And we were a, a nice a nice team. Uh, there were some really great, brilliant guys there. Some really heavy, uh, heavy people from the ray tracing, path tracing um, scene. Back in the day, there was all the latest things from, you know, stuff then picked up by NVIDIA, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure some of the people later contributed directly to what RTX, RTX is now uh, from NVIDIA and things like that. It was really great. So I was able to spend three months and taking what we have from City Engine and trying to understand how does it fit into a movie production pipeline. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So as I was going hands on, I was able to sit next to the TDs, technical directors, which literally programmed all the extensions for Autodesk Maya. It was amazing to see how much how much you can customize an application. It was almost <laughs> unrecognizable. They added tons of buttons for the artists. They added tons of scripts in the background. So you modeled you modeled a nut or something. You could click some button and it would get sent to twenty servers and converted into seven formats for seven different previous applications. It would be rendered on the on their compute or on their render farm, and a nice turntable movie was produced. So the yeah. director or the yeah. maybe not the director but kind of the supervisor of the layout department or the uh, lighting department could look at the nut and see how it looks <laughs> from all sides. 
And so I have obviously tried to to fit our procedural technology stuff for buildings into this pipeline to see how it could be used. And so I I don't remember. But this must have been around twenty. 2009, 2011. 2011? Yeah. Was it? Okay. It was funny, coincidentally, that's why I was not part of the heavy negotiations with Esri because I was in New Zealand yeah, exactly when there were the negotiations. I just wasn't sure anymore when, because obviously City Engine was released because you were using it in kind of in production, mm -hmm. um, doing your thing. We can maybe dive a little bit in deeper into this, but I wasn't sure when it was. I would have guessed around 2010, but then it was 2011. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was yeah, 2011, yeah. Mm -hmm. summer, um, autumn in New Zealand. I was able to, I was just there when there was crunch time for movies like Tintin and yeah. X-Men First Class, or I forget the name. <laughs> and there was also some, I remember there were some test shoots for The Hobbit already. Oh, for some yeah. early, early yeah. concepts, yeah. so there were suddenly dwarfs running around again. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. And also, I think there was uh, they were working back then on the model engines. I was able to yeah. to to check out to test with some model engines uh, geometry. I still remember I took the in Tintin or in X Men they had a complete, perfectly modeled Golden Gate Bridge down to the nut. It was mind boggling, and so I. For, as an exercise, I, I rebuilt this bridge in our CGI language. So then I could make it 10 times longer and oh, oh, produce nice. billions of yeah. polygons and uh, everything <laughs> everything crashed. <laughs> All the memory was used. But it was a really great uh, great exercise. At the end, I had a, a nice little uh, custom UI for City Engine where I could remote control the VETA pipeline. I could load and ingest mm -hmm. assets. Mm -hmm. So I could get assets in a nice in a suitable quality to do procedural modeling with, and they could send the whole scene back to the pipeline. So the lighting department could then pick up. But then I also had to learn the hard way that artistic control <laughs> is kind of the antithesis to procedural modeling. Yeah, yeah. We have, we in the meantime, some colleagues produce some research papers and also by ourselves how to get a, hand, a handle of, on the, of that. We call it, uh, for example, the local edits. Yeah. So you, you kind of try to pinpoint a certain part of the procedural design, you kind of lock that down or, or kind of override it with uh, handcrafted attribute values, um, but still leave the rest fully procedural. And so that's, yeah. There's some approaches, it's still not fully solved. Um, it's still hard to control, but I think we, we made some steps. Yeah. But that's, that's the hard part for organic movie productions, for art artists. Uh, it's hard to use procedural modeling in this context. So that's why typically it's used for backdrops. Yeah. When you need to have a lookalike, when you need to have quickly. Or previous is a very useful use case. For previous, you can really create a city really quickly. So you have a good starting point. That's, for example, how uh, Disney used it in Big Hero 6 or Baymax, as it was called here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where they kind of took street patterns from San Francisco and Tokyo and they melded it together in City Engine and they extruded a bunch of buildings and um, were able to get previous going real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sometimes it's astounding in how many movies City Engine was already used in. Starting from, I don't know, Cars 2, Zootopia, Baymax, and so on. So that, these were some, some of the earlier mm -hmm. ones, but Man of Steel, then also Blade Runner 2049. That one is really dear to my heart. This was kind of going full circle, right? We, we yeah. started the whole thing yeah. be because of the original Blade Runner. We were inspired by these scenes. And then to hear that City and Jim was used in a, some scenes, some smaller scenes in Blade Runner, that was really great. <laughs> that was really... Really and cool. it's humbling to see this, uh, how, how far this has gone. And obviously also some of those, uh, let's say, film credits definitely back then already helped also sell the company, right? Yeah, yeah, that was for sure important sometimes in terms of revenue, but still only a small part overall, right? It's the main application these days is in architecture and urban planning. Yeah, yeah. It's, but it's a great, maybe it's not even so important kind of financial wise, but it's very important from our personal motivations and as uh, 
outreach material. It's of course fantastic. Marketing it's very, it has uh, a huge impact. Yeah, it's easy, easily uh, kind of understandable what we're doing. We, we're creating this background city there in this scene. Yeah, that's much easier to explain than if you tell we are computing the gross cross floor area in a potential uh, neighborhood in uh, I don't know Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> it's less dry yeah, that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So looking back at your experiences at at Weta, what what were or what was the or a couple of kind of main learnings that have later on kind of really influenced the design of City Engine? So art directability, you mentioned this with kind of local edits technology. Maybe kind of interoperability. Also, I mean, you, you talked about Python before. You did a lot of Python work internally at Weta to kind of in the sense of pipeline engineering. So that's now in City Engine still a, or is a hot topic. Mm -hmm. File IO in general, import, export and so on. So these are kind of definitely in or interfacing with people with processes that automatically create turntables and send files to, I don't know, auto rig or what, whatever it is. What other things would you say impacted you? Mm -hmm. It's a bit hard to say what the direct learnings were, you know, because I was only there three months. And but for sure, yeah, the Python aspect, it's it's that's correct. Uh, making sure everything is uh, kind of scriptable, customizable. Um, I'm still not completely happy. We still have a long ways to go to make this fully customizable. Currently, I'm trying to um, make it easier to let users do custom UIs in CT Engine. Mm -hmm. Have mm -hmm. have their own. Mm -hmm. have their own views on the data, right? That's it's important. Selection is also very important. We also mm -hmm. learned that mm -hmm. from other um, use cases or, or user feedback. You have to make it easy to navigate and select the things you want to work on. Well, I guess that's also a reason we still have the Linux edition of City Engine <laughs> in a way. That's the low level kind of learnings because the animation industry to date is still fully Linux based, the big mm -hmm. studios mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, as you said, I guess I was also then honed to keep an eye out of technology from Pixar as USD, for example. Now it's getting uh, stronger and stronger, being used everywhere now also for this term metaverse, <laughs> hmm. um, mm -hmm. kind of these artificial worlds. So that's why, yeah, I, I really learned that we, we should uh, invest into adding USD into CD Engine, making sure it works nicely. And this was really nice. It's the first format which really allows us to export full cities without compromise. It was not, not, not possible before. All the other formats had some limitations. Usually when you try to import them into other apps, then you hit some problems. Yeah. With yeah. FBX, yeah. it was always the number of materials, which yeah. I think you personally had a lot of uh, pain <laughs> with that stuff. Yeah. So yeah, I think just the channel awareness of, maybe also going a bit meta, I also learned that these guys have no, how do you say that? The technology itself is not important. They have a goal set by the editors and the directors. You need to get a shot done. And so you just, you take the best tech regardless of what you had before and you, you try to do it. So I also learned to be a bit pragmatic about what to choose in terms of yeah, technologies, yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's not too long ago that um, there was kind of this statement of, uh, I think it was Joe Letary at Weta that said it's basically pretty much every two years they have a completely new pipeline. Mm -hmm. So in kind of use technology for arts purpose and not be kind of, yeah, because it's, nice to develop nice technology right so that's really really cool cool to see in, in in all of the presentations of weta and from what i hear also from the developers that i know that work there personally mm -hmm. yeah i guess it's the same also I mean, for the long time i was very skeptical of using web technology as the means of implementing desktop app uis because you always have a full browser mm -hmm. i think it's still a bit of a waste of resources i mean the tech got much more efficient the stuff got optimized, so it's much better now. But on the other hand, you get very nice UIs uh, out of it. You get very nice user experiences out of it because things look nice. It is important that thing in our business. So I guess what when the director in Adveta says it has to look like that, 
get it done somehow. Yeah. The, the kind of the analog for us is it you have to have a nice UX. It has to feel uh, pricey. <laughs> Yeah, and so we we chose to implement some of the new views in the web technology. You know, HTML, JavaScript, dark interface, dark stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big that, topic. That was very important to get. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we're still actually honing the details there. It's it's actually an art. What is a dark UI mode? It's not so easy. No, <laughs> it's no, about no. contrast. It's about nice color palettes. It's it's an art, and our product designers are investing a lot <laughs> to get this right yeah 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 yeah. so yeah kind of remove yourself a bit of, from the technology and think about what would the user like what what feels nice that's really yeah things i i, I also learned a bit at vet i would say one of those details that go a little bit in, a, in the same direction is i remember when back in the day we i gave some tech support for pixar that was mm-hmm. was using cd engine for for a long time, they were using exactly the same version of CD Engine. There were one or two or three newer versions available on the market already commercially, but they did not want to risk upgrading because any potential little detail could could have a massive impact, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which could potentially delay production, and that's incredibly costly. Mm-hmm. And um, to see that that this is completely normal in the industry and you don't need to just upgrade to the latest version is also something kind of in the sense of this tech craze. You need to be at the bleeding edge uh, of everything. It's actually quite the opposite, right? I mean, this is a multi-layered topic. and something which is almost very hard, actually. There are so many aspects. As you said, you want to have a stable workflow at your at your shop, I guess. If uh, Tool X does the job and you don't need new features or there are no severe bugs or problems, yeah. then why change? Yeah. Completely agree with that. And for me, it's so personally very important that we have long-term support and we mm. also try to support users with old versions, find workarounds in old versions if needed for, for their tasks. Then on the other hand, some of our customers have regulations and they face security critical kind of layers or interfaces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you need to update the software from time to time if security vulnerabilities are found. And so that's one of the drivers which of course. makes users update. Uh, for example, we, we actually need to do security updates because users will run our software through, through scanners, which are required by uh, kind of uh, industry standards, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think in the aut- in the automotive industry, there's some things called seal. I'm not even sure, but um, they are required that tools pass certain checks and don't find some of the recently recently discovered security vulnerabilities. And so we need to we need to upgrade, which makes our users upgrade, and so on and so on. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a kind of a hard uh, topic you have this kind of diametrally opposite things you want to have stability but then you need to update yeah yeah from uh, because of external factors and that's hard so yeah, yeah. needs needs some pragmatic uh, decision makers and, the user and there side. obviously it also has an impact on on tech support documentation and so on the commitment to actually be there for the client if in need and i do know a very specific software that we we had many licenses of um they're they're basically forcing you to upgrade to the very very latest version of the software and uh, so i can just say it's redshift by maxon they are basically forcing you to upgrade to the very latest version of the software. Otherwise, you're not getting the kind of basically technical answer if something is a bug or not. And this is for us, for example, as a company, what this meant is basically you have to just to track down if something is a bug or it's not a bug in the current version of the software, you might need to use, I don't know, a couple of days of a software developer's time to basically upgrade to the next version of the software, which may be a major version change, which can then have cascading effects in the sense of you have 
multiple other issues that arise that you didn't have, which you also need to all solve. And then basically, eventually, you, you may just get an answer of, was it a bug or not? And then if it was a bug in the older version, they are most likely not going to fix it for that older version, but they are forcing you to work only yeah, on the yeah. very latest version. And so basically, you're... I do understand it to a certain extent because you don't want to need to support a lot of like legacy if you have already moved on and fixed those issues. But on the other hand, it's really risky and costly for especially uh, uh, smaller companies that cannot just afford assigning software developers for exactly those things, mm -hmm. right? And maybe it is a little bit an extreme case or I think it is, but mm -hmm. but there's there are other sides also, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is in our field, especially on this border of 3D graphics, simulation, uh, architectural visualization. Yeah. yeah. Um, you always have kind of pipelines of tools. So you have a lot of tools which feed yeah. into each other. And that's, yeah. that's one of the problems you mentioned. If we have to upgrade one software because of a bug, yeah. Because it, it's yeah. not gay being retro corrected, you run into the danger that, for example, an import export format is not compatible anymore or has some small change which destroys your application or your workflow. We had this exactly mm. this thing. We had this multiple times where you have uh, one version of, in this case, Redshift, mm. was compiled for a specific Houdini version. Mm -hmm. But then there are these very specific build configuration where the newer version of Redshift only works for its specific builds of the next version of Houdini, which we didn't use. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's basically this cat and mouse game of having to test things. And you are not sure that because it's also another Houdini version, mm -hmm. if it then really is just an, an issue of Redshift, or it could also be an kind of, let's say, an interfering thing with Houdini. It's really hard yeah. to track it down. This is a special problem of if you develop plugins for other apps. Yeah. It's really hard. And it's something we also struggle with from time to time. Especially if you're a small team, it's really hard to maintain multiple release streams. You know, yeah. Yeah. It's basically impossible for us in terms of resources to go and fix the city engine which, which came out two years ago. And we were lucky. We It's actually funny. We recently had a lot of discussion how do we release software? You know, do you release once a year? Mm -hmm. It has pros and cons. We do you release mm -hmm. all the time, you know? You just, uh, you have a new thing ready, you ship it, you know, every every month or something like that. Yeah, yeah. In the end, and I was, after we, I can be honest, I was always on the kind of the side of, ah, just ship it, you know, as quickly as possible to the customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I kind of had to realize that this is maybe not the best idea because one thing we are pretty proud of that we have pretty solid releases because You're we released forced. we release two times a year. Yeah, we are a small team, yeah. and we spend literally more than a month uh, of testing. Yeah. from yeah. you know from the cut to the shipping to the user, it's many weeks, and we take our time to test and to let it mature. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm I'm a bit uh, now also a bit um, more conservative to say maybe you ha really have to ship not as frequently, make sure things work, and maybe also postpone a feature if you're not completely comfortable yet. Never communicate release dates. Yeah, <laughs> things like that. Yeah, that's 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 then more of uh, expectation <laughs> management and uh, marketing side, of course. It's hard, and uh, yeah, I'm long-term support and kind of uh, building the trust, you know, making sure the customer trusts you of not just abandoning him or her. Yeah. yeah. The problem, yeah. that's yeah. really important, but it's hard. Yeah, to be honest, it's, this is really hard. Yeah. But, but also if, let's say in the case of City Engine being assimilated into this very large platform that mm -hmm. is ArcGIS, obviously you want to have, you have certain standards on documentation, copywriting, like uh, proofreading that the text is solid and so on. And then, I mean, Esri was founded in 1969. Mm -hmm. So Esri has also been around for 55 years now, 59. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, so 50, around that, yeah. And now, if you have a like a technology platform like ArcGIS, you also have, it's not just you release the software, you also have to translate everything into multiple languages. And you cannot just do this for every tool, like every month. So all of these exactly, kind of propagating yeah. processes that need also to be considered, mm -hmm. documentation, all of those things, including getting, uh, let's say, tech, uh, the tech support up to speed to being able to say, hey, these, this is the change log. These are the things that have actually changed while or when the tech support people uh, are actually also giving support for multiple 3D tools at the same time, which in the bigger picture, if you realize these things in larger companies, they do start to make sense that fewer release cycles per year actually do make sense because in the end you get a better product. Right? Or you clearly label. I mean, something I could, if we have more resources, <laughs> we could, for example, also release clearly labeled unstable release once every two months mm -hmm. and, yeah but yeah. having the stable one or two releases per year yeah. this is currently not possible just for the overhead we do have a real we do we do have a nice automated build system everything pipelines you know delivery everything but you still need the verification and uh, documentation and all these things still need x amount of overhead and, uh, yeah that's just not possible at, this, at the moment yeah Yep, yep. And um, yeah, it's hard. So what would you say, what are the aspects that in this field of 3D keep you motivated in continuing to develop or work on new 3D technologies? Oh. I mean, it's of course having very nice realistic or I mean also non-photorealistic scenes of, of urban environments and I'm always fascinated being able to create worlds you know like uh, going back to the movies right mm -hmm. visualizing uh, fantastical worlds and yeah. that's the one side of course the more important even is 3D is just a tool and our world is 3D right I mean this is our standard slogan that's why we yeah. don't do just 2D GIS <laughs> we need to do 3D GIS and urban planning because cities get densified buildings get higher or even deeper into the ground at some point and these are all problems I'm really happy to help solve or play a little role with helping develop the tools so to, to the digital brush <laughs> so to say how kind of cities and li living spaces can be created in the future um, and so I'm an avid cycler right I'm, I think I mentioned it at the beginning so I'm really also would like to help making cities nicer more livable by yeah. helping to move individual traffic on the ground, maybe if it's motorized and freeing up space for pedestrians and yeah. small vehicles on the on the top side, stuff like that. And so it's kind of also like not just the technology, but also kind of the real world impact that the, yeah. the, that the tool has in its application. In and communication in also. Planning. That brings yeah. me, brings me yeah. to a nice yeah. example. I think a couple of years ago, there was a, a reconstruction project. I think the Swiss railway they own a big chunk of land, obviously, around the Zurich main station, and they rebuilt the uh, the one side of the tracks. Mm -hmm. And if, I still remember, and this brings me back to the thing about communication and using 3D visualizations as communication. Mm -hmm. I think they visualized the potential volumes they're going to build with black cubes. Mm -hmm. And this was really bad mm -hmm. because people were like, they're going to build a monster. <laughs> yeah. We don't want that. Yeah. Instead, they could have, you know, chosen, maybe with the help of our tools, they could have chosen some more subtle. Something light and, and fluffy. And, yeah, or more showing, showing multiple variations of different. Yeah, yeah. And so this is, really, this is really also something which is important to me. And using 3D to communicate ideas of, on shared spaces. Um, that's also why I like to work with a Rhino as well, and uh, developing our Rhino plugin, which is because that's a really, that's really, these are really the people or the users who, who do this kind of visualizations. You know, the guys like Foster and Partner and, and, yeah, and yeah. all these big planning companies are producing some fantastic uh, visuals and, and concepts. Housel and Lavinia is another example. Yeah. Uh, great, yeah, great yeah. work. Yeah. Really inspiring. This, this is what keeps me motivated to keep working with, with 3D. You know? Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's the general, of course, as an engineer, I'm fascinated by producing nice technical solutions to, to problems or to, to tasks and uh, having it run efficiently. The hands-on thing again. The hands-on thing, yeah. 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 And I was just also thinking about kind of this, the, the marriage of kind of CD Engine and Esri, or let's say the merging CD Engine into the whole ecosystem of Esri. One of those fundamental things that made CD Engine compatible in the first place, also that are kind of literally the link between fantasy worlds and the planned city are this thing called the shape. Mm -hmm. And I remember that many years back, I think I was having had a chat with Pascal and he said that it's kind of quote unquote very interesting that the kind of the, the building footprint or the polygon feature that, that Esri has in their uh, data structures the feature, the object of a footprint or of an, let's say, abstract representation of a building is actually, this thing is called shape, a shape feature. Mm -hmm. And that, interestingly enough, in City Engine, the input geometry that is used, that goes into the, the back then it was the grammar core, mm -hmm. right? the, 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 the procedural engine that creates the building based on the, the procedural rule this polygon, the input polygon, is also named shape. So there's this kind of link between the worlds where the where one could relatively easily see that the procedural nature of processing geometries based on a shape is actually very, very compatible to be, uh, or very suitable to be used in GIS contexts. And one of those missing links was then the coordinate systems, which were later on added deeper and deeper in, in City Engine with its mm -hmm. pros and cons and so on. But this link, the, the shape, I, I find this very, very fascinating. And you kind of you imagine what if this thing wouldn't have been called shape in the first place? Would this have had an impact on the, the negotiation for the startup exit? Because people like Jack could relate to the software because there's a shape. It's a common term for that is used in completely different use cases and applications, but it marries both worlds together. Mm -hmm. I, I found this absolutely fascinating. I, I never thought about it like that. That's literally the name shape. I That, that was vividly, I remember th this that this term was one of the binding elements that made uh, kind of the connection a lot more appealing to each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And kind of the only thing that was missing back then was, uh, I mean, it was in discussions for a longer time to, to have these the, a strong support for geographic coordinate systems and all of the projections and so on. But I, I find it's, I mean, it's, it's a tiny detail, but it's, I find this fascinating. I mean, it's actually funny. I, when I, when we first joined Esri, I was always a bit underwhelmed about how there's always these, you know, simple points and simple polygons. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. this is not interesting, you know, when you come from billions of polygons and, and yeah. NURBs and you know, subdivision surfaces high end. Yeah. But I had to realize that a polygon or a shape, a simple 2D shape is so important to us humans. You know, think of the fence around the field, yeah. the fence around yeah. the house. And it's so essential for GIS, just managing the things. And they become very quickly, very complex, you know, when it's about intersections and, uh, you know, um, contour lines, terrains and... And, and the, uh, the semantic meaning, right? And basically, literally attached to the shape was the attribution, the object attributes that were also directly applicable in the GIS world, mm -hmm. like the, the number of floors uh, or what type of usage this footprint has and so on. Um, so this, yeah, it's And I think the one, one other uh, kind of obvious match, which was realized early on, is that our technology is, was very well suited to visualize abstract geographic information yeah. by yeah. taking a simple shape, using its abstract metadata to visualize, let's say, a building when it has, you know, simple shapes that maybe the attribution of the roof shape and the ridge height 
of the roof. And yeah. so you could, yeah. with our technology, you could in a blink of an eye, you could have the volume and the roof shape. And I guess there was the, the, the nice match or the, the added value we could provide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what they were seeking. Yeah, yeah. yeah also in, in kind of in the sense of specific representation of visualizing the different or explicit geometries, but also, for example, in a little bit more abstract way. And you mentioned this at the beginning, kind of the procedural symbology, mm -hmm. in the sense that you can take, for example, a point, but build a geometry that kind of represents the meaning of what said point means. And it could be anything like, I don't know, instance, lamp poles on onto positions uh on onto those positions or create i don't know like pie charts and diagrams built in 3d geometry mm -hmm. yeah um it's that's it's such a powerful combination of Info infographics yeah. <laughs> literally place abstract representation of data on a real map yeah. in, in 3d yeah. that's yeah. that's a that's one way of communicating uh, and it's a way, but it's also very intuitive and mm -hmm. an efficient way because it's intuitive because you can relate to the three-dimensional nature of information because it's very, very natural to us. Mm -hmm. This is also why uh, the whole sidetrack that we didn't even touch yet of uh, kind of game engine-based virtual reality levels where mm -hmm. you can kind of mm -hmm. Dive into the model yourself and kind of walk around and teleport between different locations, and then switch between scenarios. You can you, you can feel the whole space in real time and change the daytime and uh, and see how the shadow behaves and so on. It's a very very natural method of communication because it's so so close to our own physiology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean the. The whole VR thing is, is very important to us here in, in Zurich. Yeah. Um, in our R&D center, we are developing an extension to ArcGIS Urban. So Urban is a specialized application for urban planning, as the name suggests. And we are developing an XR extension. So you can literally look at your urban designs and plans in the goggles, in the HM head-mounted display in your Oculus, uh, or not Oculus anymore, in the in the Vision meta Pro. quests and the <laughs> Apple Vision Pro, hope, hope, hopefully soon, and and it's really nice. It gives you the sense of scale yeah. and yeah. lighting in a way and yeah, proportions. It's interesting because just recently I saw there was a regarding City Engine or kind of an Esri packaging that also involves City Engine together with Dell. Mm -hmm. I was made aware of a, a white paper that was released very recently. It's kind of bundling of hardware together with software packages mm -hmm. in the ArcGIS platform. One of the things that I believe would also be potentially really interesting because Esri has so many government clients like city administrations and so on, local governments and larger political entities, that this kind of the, the packaging could also go not necessarily for workstations and so on, but it could also include the delivery even of sets of VR headset that are even, I don't know, come even come with the installation in like the local government building mm -hmm, or something mm -hmm. for in the sense of political participation. One thing which is important to note is that our tools are, while, while we try to make them easy to use, they are not easy to use. They are very hard to use. It mm -hmm. needs a lot of domain knowledge. You need to be aware of how data is projected or located on the earth, right? There's There are hundred, literally hundred thousands different ways of to flatten the sphere yeah. <laughs> and yeah. to project data with all different mathematical consequences and side effects. You know, you have the retainment of area or the retainment of, of length. All, all these things and or angles and then then comes the whole vr thing right yeah and what you yeah, just proposed yeah, right yeah. you then need to create well you need to create the 3d models you need to have the correct uh, kind of user interfaces uh, or the ux uh, in in vr things work differently you must not move too quickly people get sick uh, you must have nice teleportation features and all that is why it's probably better to let the user, I mean, we can have good presets, but at the end, the user still needs to have his, develop his specific application with our tools. And so, yeah, 
I guess we we could sell the engine with a VR headset, but um, <laughs> in the end, uh, it's probably best to to let it be developed at the user side to really choose combine the right tech to for a certain experience. Yeah, as, yeah. as these are usually called. Yeah. I mean, maybe with more time, a certain workflow standardization, because I mean, computer graphics is still, a, scientifically speaking, is still a very young discipline compared to other sciences that are sure. literally hundreds of years old. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> or even thousands, right? <laughs> and But maybe there are some, with the standardization of tools, there's a crystallization of certain workflows that just become a standard that need or are optimized for VR experiences or whichever specific planning process. I mean, producing content is the, the big problem currently, right? That's all these people who talk about metaverses and uh, creating persistent uh, alternative worlds or alternative yeah. realities, yeah. Yeah. being it XR or VR or AR or yeah. whatever, yeah. Yeah. or just plain. I mean, it could also just be, <laughs> I mean, Theoretically, it goes down to text-based <laughs> interfaces, you know, all these, it's all about content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the hard part. I think that's where the bottleneck is in the future to, to be able to create enough content for these applications. And so the term AI comes again, right? This, that's why I think we, we are still very at the very beginning of having a standardized way of dealing with these worlds, which lasts for decades, you know. Yeah, I mean, we're still in the uh, kind of the, the transition phase where wild, we have wild technology shifts every few years. And I fully agree. But also, if you look at just the life cycle of one building, let's say that typical modern building has probably an 80 year life cycle, mm -hmm. which is kind of comparable to literally to a human being, right? Mm -hmm. So, from the inception to the building of the main structure, like the concrete slabs and the walls and all of that stuff, that may over the course of a couple of decades change with the usage. So, the main structure is not demolished. It's just you, you rip out some walls and add some new ones and kitchens and all of that stuff. Remove the asbestos. <laughs> Remove, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, and then eventually, and obviously there are these architectural design paradigms that basically tell you that use the resources that you have wisely. So create something that, or some, the base design of the building that uses by far most of the energy, the gray energy that goes into the creation of the building mm -hmm. or over accumulated over the whole life cycle of the mm -hmm. entire building by far like 80 percent is invested in the creation of the basic structure at the very beginning and then the rest is just maintenance like heating and so on like obviously considering all mm -hmm. of the, mm -hmm. the the gray energy that goes into the production of the concrete and so on but yeah you want to use uh, designs that are very generic reusable and then eventually the building will get uh, demolished and something new comes which kind of now brings me actually into this tangent of going into the aec market so architecture mm -hmm. engineering and construction so basically the cad tools the cad applications BIM, yeah. The BIMs and so on, and uh, facility management and all of those processes that go into the kind of actual planning, construction and maintenance of projects that can take decades. And it's very interesting. A, a couple of months ago, I was in a, in, a, in a meeting, actually two meetings with a very large company, and they say they have projects that last 50 years. Because if it's infrastructure related, then how do you tackle even these things so right so there's a little next topic for you interfacing with kind of procedurally creating hundreds of thousands of individual 3d buildings for a movie like i don't know zootopia yeah, yeah. but then now kind of bridging also coming from the gis world and supporting and, these long processes and then yeah. e exactly so where are let's dive a little bit maybe into these challenges so yeah this this is a very interesting topic and actually I came across this over the years a couple of times. First was in the context of archaeology. There was yeah. a European research project. It was called 3D Coform. And uh, one of the tasks there was to figure out, um, let's assume we do a survey of an archae archaeological dig, but afterwards it's uh, kind of, you know, remote reconstructed. They build a, a skyscraper <laughs> on top of it, so it's lost forever. 
It's so like now we have a bunch of preservation, basically. Yeah, now we have a bunch of digital data. Yeah. How can we make sure that this is readable in 100 years? Yeah. yeah. I mean, my first reaction was, this is impossible. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Imagine, try to read a Word file from 15 years ago. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's even possible. I don't know. But normally you will have a lot of problems. If it's not a standard TXT, ASCII, character set kind of data description, yeah. it's hard. You know, process, if it's binary data, processes change, memory changes, everything changes all the time. And it needs a lot of conscious effort to support. And at Esri, we have a lot of effort to read old files. So because we, we have this mantra of be flexible what you read and be strict what you write. Yeah, uh, so yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I think we, as we can literally, or ArcGIS, our platform, we can literally read, we call them geo databases and shape files from 30 years ago still. Because as you said, this is so important. There's so many data archives with very old files, you know, coming from the DOS 8.3 file name era. Yeah. Which still are relevant and are very valuable. Limited so. character lengths of paths, paths and attribute names with just eight characters. Yeah, all, all this stuff. All this <laughs> stuff. And so it is not sexy at all, but you yeah. but it's very important to users. Yeah. And we need to be able to read old scenes. It's the same goes for City Engine in its small niche. We try very hard to read old scene files from ten years ago still. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's, yeah. people spend time and you want to be mindful of their work. So, yeah, but it's a hard topic. And in the end, it's kind of like two heads or two souls in me. I, while I um, can geek out about the latest USD file format, which is super, you know, composable and mm -hmm. non-destructive layering of data. This is much harder to read in 20, 50 years than a simple OBJ file for yeah. those who know it, which has an ASCII character-based description of mesh geometry yeah. and can, can of course not store animations, cannot store simulation results, cannot store camera lens characteristics, but at least you can still read it. So you have to be very mindful what format you use and which, uh, for which purpose. Yeah. You know, so. yeah. yeah. I mean, the, it's also something in the, in the film industry, right? It's happened happens so often that you let's say you have a you have a movie um no actually let me give you another example it's it's not a movie actually let me go even back one step <laughs> further because i wanted to tell you this like half an hour ago i do remember also many years back you, you said hey there's this really cool books from J.R.R. martin game of thrones and how cool would it be if they ever produced the tv series uh -huh, yeah. and how cool would it be if they had uh, would need to build the buildings using city engine now, a couple of years later, it actually happened. Mm -hmm. And also they did use City Engine to, to create in, yeah. in, in, in one of the last seasons where, mm -hmm. uh, to, to create some of those King's Landing. digital sets. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's fantastic, right? But the example I wanted to give there has literally happened. So you have, let's say, season one, you have the dragon. And now a couple of years later, another visual effects studio gets the job to produce another season. Now, taking these dragon animations and models that are produced in tool A, and now you have to hand over the data coming from, I don't know, Maya version, I don't know what. Now you have to somehow try to translate the information into this other animation package that works completely different. So you have zero standardized file formats that could bring the things from yeah, tool A yeah. to tool B. And that's a nightmare. Yeah, this is a very hard topic because <laughs> it's not always obvious that you actually want to do this. I mean, maybe you want to have, get some textures. I mean, you, you, have, you obviously have the final look, right? Sometimes I'm going on a limp here. We, I'm not really up to date. Current pipeline uh, kind of interrupt uh, the latest in how a pipeline's interface. But sometimes it could be actually cheaper to remodel the asset because the other shop uses completely different tech. That's, so the that file... Would, that what very even if they happens. could read, let's yeah. say the alembic or USD file, maybe it's rigged completely differently, different way of surface modeling. You never know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, as a, from an engineering point of view, it would be, of course, awesome if everybody uses USD, <laughs> assuming all the features are there. Yeah, 
yeah. that they can just hand off files. It's also the legal aspect. <laughs> Let's not yeah, yeah, yeah. forget that part. So yeah, it, this is a this is a hard problem, but it's also not so easy. There's also not really one way to do this. Uh, for example, there's also this story of right. Uh, you have the Star Wars movie, and you want to make a Star Wars game. Yeah. Depending on the game platform, you cannot. It doesn't even make sense to use the same assets because yeah. they're way yeah. too heavy, or yeah. 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 they don't look nice in the game engine versus the uh, movie production ray tracer, whatever. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Simon's world. <laughs> There's no easy answers. Yeah. <laughs> well, you mentioned it before the plugins mm -hmm. that now brings the core CD engine functionality into these other tools like Grino, for example, with Puma. There's Palladio that brings the functionality into Houdini. Let's dive a, a little bit into those and kind of also this notion of open source development, because these plugins, they are open source, so you can kind of fork and build on top of them. Let's explore this space a little bit on uh, also kind of the decision of uh, going closed source, open source, and so on. What what your stance is on that? Well, yeah, I try to avoid the term open source for our plugins because it implies all the all these kind of also IP aspects. Yes, what yes. We, what we do is that our plugins based on City Engine have the source code available. That's basically as I would put it as a means of outreach. So what we do is we we have the license requirement that. If the user wants to use these tools to do commercial work, he must also own a copy of City Engine. That's the yeah. that's the yeah. simple yeah. rule. Yeah. Yeah. And we really uh, have the source code available to also give the user the ability to modify the tools to his or her needs. It is a great um, way of showcasing our APIs, our precision modeling APIs and SDKs. And it really gives us uh, more flexibility, right? We can develop in the open. It also inspires more trust from developer customers. Yeah. They, they see what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. They can maybe also even maybe help us fix bugs. That would be great. We got some uh, feedback and contributions over the years. And I think one of the greatest misconceptions is that you cannot have open source code and make profit at the same time. Mm. This, I, I, I see this every every time. I mean, the best examples against this concept is or this uh, misconception is what the Epic does. Yeah, Unreal Engine is yeah. the source code is available, yeah. and they still make a ton of money, <laughs> 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 or at least they used to with Fortnite. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so, I, in an ideal world, I would like to all have our our um, products open, <laughs> but it's not or a source code available because that's a learning from Veta. You want to enable the user to customize your tool because most of the user can actually leverage that. I know there's some discussion of making things as easy as possible, but you can have both. You can have a very nice end user experience prepackaged, but still have the source code available for the user to develop his in house extensions. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. So this actually scales from as individual users to big corporate customers. Yeah. 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 yeah but, but that's exactly the dynamic because it's not just about kind of only locking others from kind of let's say, stealing your IP, but also this psychological aspect of the gesture of let's collaborate on this mm. and build great things together. I mean, of course, but I just described, I would like to open up. This is, of course, super naive because there is, of course, all these international, you know, this competition, there is uh, IP stealing, copying, uh, industrial espionage, uh, all the legal things. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Of course, this will never happen. At, at this scale, yeah. But I, I think I, un I understand the vision. Mm. Having said that, it's still, it also enforces you to be on top of your game because if everybody can see your algorithm, yeah. how you do the modeling, then, of course, you need to trust in in your legal system that if you see obvious ripoffs yeah. you know you probably m want or need to go after them yeah yeah, yeah. um there's an unclear debate of they can still reverse engineer your stuff if the source code is open or not probably doesn't even matter <laughs> so much yeah. i yeah still maybe it's naive but i still think that the source code 
is not so important if it's hidden or not, because there's so much more making a product. You know, most of the people, I mean, we have now have the source code open of our plugins for years, 10 years, right? Almost yeah, or yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. Most of the people are asking for the binaries, the, the app itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's hard to, not many people have the, the skills and the knowledge to, or want to invest the times, yeah, to, to be fair to them. To build this stuff themselves. So. Yeah. No. I'm um, because especially in the context of, of Palladio, the Houdini plugin mm. that we together were started. Yeah. Started quite some time ago. We discussed before. When it was 2014, 2015? 13, 14 was 13, it was 14, your 15. idea. Was your idea? Yeah. You started the idea, and then the first uh, release was some zero, some dot six release or something yeah. like that in 2015 i believe yeah yeah, yeah right so almost almost 10 years ago and we we did have some of those uh, discussions on i was like should we go for this should we f go for that and in the end yeah it's i definitely learned a lot of those things especially regarding kind of user trust and what is value and what does uh, source code protection really mean in the end but you mentioned the, the, the keyword before, right? It needs to be somehow enforceable also then by, by law, right? Yeah, but you, in my experience, you better and invest in a great solution, in a added value for the user, in a good accessible tool, than invest all your energy in protecting the IP and the source code. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, Of course, you're always in the risk of some big player stealing your idea and just releases it. In its, in its own name. But then again, also there, there's also one of those kind of fundamental learnings that I took from my time at Procedural. I think this was actually one of the statements of Pascal is that companies don't buy startups for the tech they have developed. For the people. They are, yeah. they are yeah. buying them for, for exactly for the people, for the talent. And so, which is another factor in, the, in this whole discussion about should it be open source or closed source? The sense in the end, it it doesn't matter if you if you have access to the people, right? Yeah, and even for something as little as the plugins, I think uh, it's also about that the user kind of sees who we are and what we do. Yeah, yeah, and that yeah. It, this will live on yeah. Yeah. in for the long game. Yeah, I'm sure in our case we are part of Esri now because of the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Doesn't sound very humble, but <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it it was also that that's something that we had a. I I don't know what it, when this was like two or three years ago. There was this procedural reunion, mm. that where I was also invited, and there Dominic actually Dominic Taroli, one also one of the founders of procedural back then. He held this presentation and and kind of mentioned something that was a like a little bit of magical in the sense of there there was this startup that got sold and it had I think eleven or 12 employees in general, but only kind of two of the members of the kind of this original crew left mm -hmm. the team procedural. There was Basil, who founded his kind of game company, super successful. Mm -hmm. And I... Urban Games, and shout out. Shout out to Urban <laughs> Games, exactly. Uh, yeah, and then myself, kind of with a little bit of detour, I also founded a company that still has to Urban Games. I mean, they're working on cities, city simulation and so on. Um, myself also working in the field of 3D, the city is heavily using mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Esri technology in, in general. But yeah, pretty much the rest of the team is kind of, you could say, still intact, working on exactly the same thing. There's, I don't know what it is, but there's this kind of a magical glue. That, I don't know, yeah. Th and that's so rare. That's I've, I've so been, rare. I'm, I'm really grateful for this mix of people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Honestly, I don't really know what it is either. <laughs> what would make us uh, a great team for a long time? Uh, you know, no no major drama. Of course, there's uh, heavy discussions, a lot of technical yeah. Yeah. disagreements, yeah. or but never, you know, always being, never playing, uh, how do you say that, below the... Below the... <laughs> yeah, this is where the German um, <laughs> phrases come in. <laughs> Play fair, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Uh, being respectful of the persons, yeah. of the people. Yeah. Um, fighting about the tech, fighting about priorities. Yeah. But then still having a beer in the evening, stuff yeah. like that. It's, yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, that's I'm very grateful for that, and it's it's really rare. Um, we have a we have a low fluctuations as well. I'm very proud of that. Yeah, in our place. Oh, that's super amazing. So moving on from here into the future, I mean, you mentioned USD, which or open USD as it's called yeah. at the moment, right? Which has a tremendous potential. How do you see kind of this open USD as its own thing, and then your personal impact on the future of City Engine, the three D technologies within the Esri universe, but then also in, te- in extension to 3D in general. How do you see these things continue in the sense also of the progression of computer graphics as a discipline? Yeah. So one aspect is for sure that we, so in the field of computer graphics, I mean, the whole geometry processing and handling, we will certainly continue to make our procedural modeling language more powerful Um, that it can do more complex, maybe also more organic, more meaningful geometry and output for city design, urban planning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or maybe still, yeah, also for, you know, the metaverses, the games, the movies. That's certainly something where we just now have very good young talent, you know, coming fresh from research, from their thesis uh, with great ideas to be able to, to create much more intricate designs but still being fully procedural and still keeping the language nice and concise. Yeah, That's certainly one aspect where we try to make use of the latest graphics research um, or geometry research rather. Um, then in graphics, for a long time, we kind of had the paradigm that we, we model mm-hmm. and we have a nice kind of preview quality output, but we leave the super high-end high-end visualization to the other guys who can do that much better or who invested much more than we do. The Unreal guys, the Unity guys, the Redshift guys, the mm-hmm. whatever guys, mm-hmm. right? All the high-end renders, the NVIDIAs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of the specialty in modeling cities, yeah. basically. I mean, nowadays with with all these generative AI things where you basically can synthesize from already super high-end visualizations into new high-end visualizations, I'm not sure how long this all this paradigm we can hold up and if we need to rethink. We are currently experimenting as everybody, you know, you try, you feed in low quality or preview quality uh, city layout into a generative AI mm-hmm. and you let it uh, let it up-res basically, you know, and relight the whole scene. You get super nice results. Um, the hard part is to control it, that it's still your idea and you don't get influenced by what yeah. it learned. Yeah, that's yeah. a different topic. So that's the uh, kind of the visualization side. Um, but then I have to kind of circle back to the IO thing, which is so important for many workflows. And there I really hope we can, I'm, tr- I'm exploring if we can marry the old, crusty, but very solid, mature and, and useful way we store geographical information with these new learnings and insights, for example, from Pixar. I mean, OpenUSD is basically their child of five in-house iterations of how to store scenes over the last 25 years. Yeah, yeah. This this is a a super great job they did. I'm I'm still boggled how they could convince their board to invest so much and give so much back to the world, basically, of their in-house investments. Yeah, it's yeah, not. Yeah. It's not a. It's not a given. So it's a fantastic. And so if we could marry these two worlds in, for our specific purpose, right? Right. That we are at this cross, at this interface of GIS and uh, building information models and AEC and geo design and all this mix of tech. As an engineer, I would love, I would love to see um, that we can combine these two technologies. So one one really hands-on thing is. We are now trying to join the OpenUSD Alliance and help yeah. them add yeah. 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 geo-referencing, so the, the technology of making USD coordinate system aware, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. so something we might collaborate with NVIDIA, because NVIDIA is also investing heavily in the, the OpenUSD, omniverse thing. in their Omniverse uh, suit of tools. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of buzzwords, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but... Um, 
You're a busy man. I would really love to see that we can leverage because efficiency is getting a problem. We data sets get bigger and bigger. Yeah. I mean, of course, hardware gets faster and faster, but we also need to... Energy consumption also goes sure, up. Sure, and we yeah. need to go from very heavy survey data, which has been reconstructed yeah. and georeferenced, but then you need to distill it down and view it on your phone. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. view it yeah. on your lightweight device, uh, browser. Um, browsers are still... The, the whole WebGL uh, front-end technology has still some limitations in terms of the amount of data you can load. There's some sec yeah. security measurements yeah. which yeah. kind of limit what you can do in the browser. So if kind of this efficient intermediate representation is kind of key when you want to have an efficient GIS pipeline. Yeah. 3D GIS pipeline, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, also what we saw before, kind of, I mean, if you look at the AEC market, mm -hmm. kind of CAD, BIM and so on, and they're slow, really, really slow, merging or like touching uh, with the GIS world, kind of mm. with the tools slowly, slowly to, uh, to start to understand each other. And both of those, I mean, they started, let's say, around long ago. 40 but years ago or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, the development of GIS started in the 80s, so there's, there's at least 40 years of history in GIS. There's in the computerized uh, GIS, you mean? Y yes, guess, yes, yeah. yes. Anything, that, basically the, the digital stuff. Mm -hmm. and same thing also in the CAD world, BIM mm -hmm. world. And now kind of these things slowly merging together. It just takes a long time to develop the protocols and the standards and so on. I mean, these are slow moving industries by design because yes. they affect heavy infrastructure and, and it's slow moving with little regulations yeah and, yeah building life uh, life cycles we, yeah, we talked about this decades before right? and decades yeah. but do you see in the sense of that best example i had before is the shape mm -hmm. that is it means that it has the semantic connotation of this represents a footprint mm -hmm. it's a metaphor it's polygonal definition or it's a mathematical definition of, I don't know, a couple of points and lines between the edges, but it means something. It's a semantic connotation of... Abstraction of, of the world. E yeah. Exactly. It's an abstraction of the world. Do you think there could be a potential of kind of combining all of those complexities of, let's say, really complex BIM processes, really complex GIS processes, high-end visualization, computer graphics, and so on. But that is also, let's say, infinitely storable in the sense of, uh, we mentioned also this kind of data preservation mm -hmm. for the centuries, that there could be one day some sort of data representation that actually, instead of an explicit "Quote unquote file format like mm. DXF or a shapefile could actually be some sort of semantic representation that is just represented in the latent space of an AI machine learning model. Yeah. The sense of that it just tries to kind of memorize the thing, but instantaneously convert between the semantic meanings. So you you don't have an explicit file format like ASCII based text." that could be just constantly kept in memory, basically. So basically you're looking for a technology which kind of basically is around for decades and yeah. kind of is kind of the household way to do 3D. Yes, yes. That would be like if you understand the abstract representation of what a polygon is and it means something like what is a footprint, then as a human being or how we are thinking and interact with the three-dimensional world, we constantly work with abstractions. And whether we are interacting with CAD to plan a 3D building or we visualize something for the use in, in virtual reality, all of those things are technically abstractions, but using crutches, technological yeah, yeah. crutches. If you would derive a system that understands the semantic meaning plus all of the transformers or the transformation between mm -hmm. them, like, you know, the, the transformers in the sense of uh, in chat GPT, yeah, all, of, yeah. all of those AI related meanings of the term transformer. If you could basically constantly keep this stuff in a memory and on the fly 
convert between the meanings and the semantic representations, you could basically eliminate the necessity for even storing the data in specific file formats. Always, always compute everything on demand. It, exactly. Because uh -huh. I mean, it's. I mean, it's, you're basically visioning and visioning the the Uber procedural description or. AI latent space, I mean, there's some similarities. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's like hell on steroids, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> this is hard. This is not... It would be very nice if we could finally solve this description problem we have yeah, yeah. and this lossy conversion problem and this uh, many wheels being reinvented all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard. Yeah, I really don't know. I mean, <laughs> I'm very humble and, and happy that we now have at least GLTF and USD, which give <laughs> us some sense of yeah. standards. Yeah. If you yeah. look closely, you it's fraying at the edges, of course. Everybody has their own extension already. Yeah. Yeah. I think it needs a couple of decades of more of these kind of evolutionary steps. Yeah. yeah. And maybe we end up at something like the smartphone form factor or the flat screen we yeah. have now, yeah. which are kind of... I'm, just, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, analogies in our other household items, which kind of, they're probably, I'm not even sure, I don't know, I'm not familiar with the history of TV so much, but there were probably mm -hmm. all kinds of form factors over the 120 years or so. Yeah. <laughs> and now we ended up at this uh, 16 or 16 by 10, 16 by or by 9, nine whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flat dish designs on a swivel stand, kind yeah. of. Maybe we, at some point the 3D slash AEC slash JS industry might end up at some yeah, yeah. similar Uber format, but uh, currently it's still, it's less Wild West, but it's still pretty much Wild West. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because we, now we currently, while we, while we finally have some standardized geometry, we have all kinds of problems on the shader side. I think yeah. you you ver know very well uh, in your porting materials is life. The biggest biggest issue <laughs> and then you know animation simulation results inter oh there comes my favorite thing interactivity something yeah. which is completely missing yet still is a standard way of describing how a user can interact with a 3d scene you know yeah. this is this is always completely custom logic on top of the data yeah it's part of the app which shows the data it's not built in yet and so i mean some of the metaverse uh, protagonists talk about we need the html for the 3d worlds right html and javascript kind of yeah. enable to describe the interactivity of websites but they're now talking about how can we modify usd to describe where an object can be grabbed in vr space or things so like that opening and, doors and so on yeah exactly not just storing the animation, but literally also describe. And there are initial research, there are prototypes, there's stuff going on, but we're far away from having yeah, a standard yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I mean, and I'm pretty in, sure, excuse me, I'm pretty yeah. sure there will be always a layer on top where we need another kind of unions of approaches. And yeah. So, yeah, I'm not sure if this dance will ever stop, <laughs> to be yeah. honest. <laughs> I think I saw in a, in a podcast, uh, couple of months ago that one of the biggest motivators of, of humans is is not money it's actually greed and uh, so it's basically kind of one of those fundamental driving forces that push us humans to basically constantly be better than the other guy and one of those things then manifests in itself in in uh, exactly this circle of you have a cool technology, I need to build on top of it. I need to have something that gives me this one unique little detail that put, gives me the edge in the competition in the business. Mm. Right? And that's an endless cat and mouse vicious circle that, that will keep spinning and spinning and spinning because, yeah. That's fortunately not my role. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to provide and deliver technology, which is yeah. <laughs> great for the users. I, I leave the profit making to others <laughs> and being uh, greedy and yeah having yeah. big egos to yeah. want to be better than others this is not it's not me <laughs> yeah it's i see exactly where, where i'm also not mm. if if somehow possible 
if we could manage without that, the world definitely would be a better place. I mean, right? right. Of course, I, <laughs> of course, I know that we we need to make tools and sell them to be yeah. to have revenue and to yeah. f to function. Yeah. That's yeah. it's a given. Yeah. Um, but I I like <laughs> to have my little naive world of you know, <laughs> I would like to provide the tools for the artists. Yeah, to yeah. paint the world. Yeah. <laughs> That's a yeah. bit of the <laughs> naive uh, view, but it's. it's uh, I think this helps you to keep a sane mind, and to enjoy the daily work and fix problems, you know, and uh, find new solutions to task difficult tasks and so. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Which brings me to the topic of how do you keep sane in this highly technical work related world so what are the things that you are doing to kind of shut off like in your spare time oh man i mean <laughs> i mean there's always an interesting youtube video to watch about some new 3d technology <laughs> so that's that's still close to work of course you um, mentioned biking and then right? of course sports yeah. yeah i enjoy the outdoors a lot i'm probably every weekend and maybe also the one day of the week i'm i'll spend in nature on my bike or I also help people fix bikes. Um, this is, goes in the direction of, you know, recycling and being mindful of resources. Yeah. So I want to make sure, especially in, on, on my hobby of cycling, that uh, people are empowered to fix their bikes. Uh, bike shops, <laughs> to be specific, are in high demand. They have long queues, which is great, of course. But small things should be... I, I, I teach people to fix uh, small things, so they are not... Uh, kind of blocked riding the bike for two weeks just because they have a flat tire. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my, my little world of teaching how to fix bikes. It's a little volunteer thing we do together with uh, my colleague Stefan from work. We help out in a local neighborhood center to it's run. It's basically a, a non-profit location where you can go and yes. and teach people. And uh, so it's like a... It's literally run by the city. It's a neighborhood uh, community center. Yeah. Yeah. With an open workshop and a few hours per week, we just take it over and have an open door for people with little or actually also big <laughs> problems on, on their <laughs> bicycles. And we have we have everything and it's a very interesting place also socially and uh, psychological wise. Uh, I learned a lot um, how to kind of motivate people to be patient and to be to mm. open their mind to learn how to fix the bike. A lot of people have, are quite um, afraid of doing something wrong. And I always tell, the first thing I tell them, in order to learn to fix a bike, you need to accept that it takes three times as long and on the first time you break something. <laughs> <laughs> it's always like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but somehow this also um, helps me at work. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you you do your thing, you know it very well, you're doing it for years. You have somebody else who wants to come in and join yeah. to, you know, a new colleague. Yeah. 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 And it kind of helps you. You need to put yourself in the other person's shoes and realize that you cannot take anything for granted and yeah. you need to be mindful of their skills and or maybe limitations. And yeah, this is quite meta now, but uh <laughs> There's somehow there's the similarities. Um, I, I guess in the end it's it's easy. It's just you know dealing with people, working with people. Yeah, yeah. Um, have constructive or positive uh, feedback, m motivate them, kind of alleviating their fears in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's really great. It's, I mean, to be honest, it's always very hard. You work a whole day and then you spend three hours in the workshop with twenty people who have the question at the same time. <laughs> Maybe there's some, some children running around when yeah. I help the dad yeah. or the yeah. mom <laughs> screw in a screw, get impatient, but it's great. Uh, it's yeah. a great uh, school it's school of life. Definitely <laughs> a great use way to, words. to disconnect because you're ripped out of your computer world, right? Yeah, and it makes you physically tiring, tired, yeah. you know, yeah. it's great. So yeah, biking is my, my personal little mm -hmm. safe place. Mm -hmm. And of course, doing that in a group is even better. So yeah, with like-minded people. And yeah. I'm also happy to, to even on a rainy day, maybe I contribute to some bug fixes to an, an open source project. I'm helping out with USD itself a bit, providing yeah. some bug fixes yeah. and so. And uh, yeah, generally, I like to learn. You know, I'm 
subscribe to many YouTube channels with latest in graphics and tech and astronomy. I'm also a bit of an astronomy geek. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, fascinated by watching SpaceX build rockets. I also not very happy about their boss, but uh, what, can you, <laughs> what can you do? And I like to cook. <laughs> very basic things. Yeah, cooking is a great uh, way of taking a break. You know. Baking a bread twice a week is, is a little hobby or just a routine. <laughs> I mean, it's these are these it's are the, simple the things. Nice, the simple these things. are the nice little things. Yeah, spending time with the partner, of course, and uh, things like that. I know from you, you, you listen to tons of podcasts. Yeah, that's also great. And mine, yeah. uh, I mean, there are also. I mean, you mentioned astronomy, physics, tech, sci-fi, fantasy. There's a whole spectrum. Politics right? as well. A bit, Politics. Uh, not too much. It's, <laughs> it's a bit uh, draining at times. Yeah. Let's say any podcast that you can recommend that you think is maybe a little bit lesser known, but you think is, is a pearl that you think might be worth sharing? Yeah, so there's two German ones. Um, so that's a bit, maybe a bit hard for the general audience here, but <laughs> one is called uh, Methodisch Incorrect. Mm -hmm. These are two physicists from Germany and they have a great way of they always pick two topics, scientific, so they present two scientific papers, mm -hmm. very wide range of topics from biology to quantum physics to mm -hmm. med medicine to psychology. But it's really funny and uh, they, they have this, these are really normal guys, but they're doing it now for over 10 years. They have, I guess, a following in the hundred thousands. Nice. They do also live shows nowadays, 25 a year even. <laughs> they also talk a bit about their private lives, share some stories. It's just a great way of relaxing. You learn something, you're a bit entertained by, you know, the one, one guy, he mo recently moved, the company broke his TV, mm -hmm. and now he has his weekly report of how the lawsuit is going. <laughs> 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 it's, yeah, it's great. And so that's the one, Methodisch Incorrect. And there's also another one, it's called the uh, Lobbuch Netzpolitik. These are two people roughly associated, or one is strictly associated, the other one is not anymore, with the uh, Chaos Computer Club Germany. So the CCC, it's a big association of hackers and makers, and <laughs> it goes from people who developing their own uh, microelectronics or restoring uh, Apollo flight computers to people sewing their clothes with, uh, you know, computers inside and our security researchers. Uh, some of these people are actually, they go to the German government and consult them in yeah. digital processes. Yeah. And yeah. well, mostly they tell them what they're doing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and so these two guys, they talk about the latest in, it's hard to describe, it's about it's mainly about internet and its effects on society and politics and all the things which go wrong all the time in terms, of, especially in, in Germany, they have a lot of problems in, in digitalization or yeah. in, yeah. Yeah. in yeah. converting old crusty processes in modern solutions, you know. And so they, they just discuss topics and usually they make fun of the latest fuck ups. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great. It's uh, they have a great way. One of these guys is actually a security researcher. He actually tests uh, security problems at companies. So he's very close to the yeah. latest in terms of, you know, CPU bugs, which leak data and, yeah, yeah, or yeah. bad processes in companies or DRM going gone wrong and <laughs> all these things, or also, you know, surveillance problems a lot of data privacy topics and so yeah these two podcasts so methodisch incorrect and logbuch netzpolitik for our german listeners these are some of my recommendations very cool and of course there's this british podcast called oh god what now it was called the brexit Deers or something they, they started uh, during brexit uh -huh. and it's basically just a a bittersweet black humor uh, view on British politics and the absolute madhouse they have there. Nice, it's a, nice. It's, it's a bit of a guilty pleasure almost. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, but cool. I, I subscribe to over 200 podcasts, so it's really hard to. Yeah. 
recommend <laughs> anyone specific. You, you mentioned some of the metrics last time we meant uh, how like <laughs> the, the counter of how many hours is like incredible but i don't really know by heart but it's many many days of podcasts <laughs> over the over the years yeah i mean it's information it's knowledge it's worth a lot and there are so many fantastic podcasts and i don't know documentaries out there on youtube and uh, one has to be careful i mean yeah. i realized that these people are not trained journalists right you get very personal views on the world so you need to be careful to not confuse podcasts with professional news of no yeah. of, of course it's of more course. something i tell myself all yeah, the time yeah, right yeah, yeah. Yeah. As in my case, podcasts replace pretty much the conventional radio and newspaper yeah. reading. Yeah. You need to realize that you are not getting a objective view, if that even exists, on, on the world. And you still need to check with, uh, of course, state media, independent media. And you, I, I try to really balance it with yeah, 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 some yeah, yeah. newspapers. I mean, th this is just the, the standard with the internet, right? There's a strong tendency that you can get into basically this echo chamber like I mean, mindset, yeah. right? It's Look at all these people hanging out on TikTok and then believing all all kind of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I I fully agree. But still, I mean, there's this is also something that you need to learn to navigate to be able to and very consciously try to see multiple sides of a thing and be open to the fact that there may be multiple sides to yeah. something. Must um, be part of education. It's it. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Children and young people need to be trained, and I guess everybody needs to be trained. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, yeah, we talked about a lot of things. So I would say we slowly wrap it up. Mm -hmm. um, I was just trying to figure what did we miss that is important. I mean, it's been a lot of information. It's been a, quite a history, right? Also for me, it's been fantastic. But otherwise, I mean, you can feel free to bring something up that you would like to address. Otherwise, there's just as usual the kind of the last three questions. I was just reminded of my internship I once did to mm -hmm. build a FM radio equipment a uh, long, long time ago. That was also great. That That's was more, more of the electrical engineering. engineering yeah. yeah, yeah. That was a very nice uh, learning phase for me and uh, i still remember my boss so while we were i think we were discussing careers and phds and, and he, he said you know nobody is waiting for dr simon and that was also when i was at the difficult situation where i had to decide if this phd is worth my another one or two years of investment or I just yeah. want to help the startup yeah. yeah i was reminded of that quote again yeah, yeah. because uh there I did hands-on work. I was solving a hands-on problem and I, I, I realized this is what gives me joy yeah. and not doing some academic paper. Yeah. Because in the end, the paper I co-authored, which started the whole uh, city engine thing, in a way, this was it's still very hands-on. Yeah. This was not an abstract mathematical paper of some super high-end algorithm. Yeah. yeah. In the end, it's pretty down to earth. You know, we taking shapes, we split them, <laughs> yeah, doing yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so I really realized this is more of my world, you know, being hands-on. And this is also, I realize every day I, I enjoy doing the hands-on stuff. And, yeah. and so, uh, yeah, that's where I learned how to program USB connections, and <laughs> laying out, uh, laying out electronic sports. And, but this is tough. Yeah. This is still, uh, I really like that when we did, develop desktop apps, we have this kind of standardized compilers and tools. And yeah. in the electronics yeah, yeah, world, yeah. you are still uh, very locked, vendor locked in and the tools are quite bad in terms of UX and user friendliness. And so I kind of don't miss the electronics development. <laughs> yeah. But I'm also not very deep. I was not very deep in it. So yeah. Yeah. need to be fair here. It's probably also changed a lot in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. This whole notion I'm I mean, I, I sense this very, very, uh, for years and years, mm. this very strong humbleness in in you with kind of being being the hands-on guy, don't mm. not necessarily need, needing this or that or the other title that that you would no. well deserve, and the, also kind of that all of the things that you're describing, the hands-on stuff, it's not 
it really comes across as very natural that you literally mean it in the sense of it's not even that much different than baking a bread twice a week. <laughs> and yeah, this is what I what I absolutely admire about you and your oh, character you. and your, your humbleness. And uh, I mean, we've had many, many chats over the years. And yeah, this was also always something that I, I deeply admired in, in your character. And uh, so there's a lot of respect for that from, from my side. <laughs> Even taking some of your time uh, for also for recording an episode for this oh sure sure podcast yeah. right <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean what what would three D worlds and three D environments be without three D cities and thus city engine right mm -hmm. so you're one of the core and key players in that field yeah but I would say let's dive into some of the last questions sure. so. If you would have to recommend a book that everybody should read, I mean, we talked about podcasts and a lot of and the internet and so on, but kind of books, what would you recommend? Can be anything and why? <laughs> so as probably has come through between the lines, I'm, <laughs> I'm a fan of sci-fi and fantasy and these kind of genres. Uh, both the dystopian stuff. So, I mean, Neuromancer is, of course, and probably has been mentioned a lot of times here. Not yet, no. <laughs> That's, of course, a very nice book to read. And um, then I can uh, also, I, I very much enjoy to read the works of INM Banks, the culture series. Mm. It's sci fi to its extremes, <laughs> where humanity has basically transcended all problems. Humanity lives as trillions of people, carefree. Everybody has anything. The society is run by AI minds. They also run the spaceships and the stations and yeah. everything. And people just do what they want. And, <laughs> and, uh, and you still get uh, very nice stories and conflicts. And this, this is also the novels which uh, inspired Elon Musk's the names for his drone ships where he catches the, the rockets. Oh. Yeah. Of course, I still oh, love okay. you. This, yeah. One of one of the quirks of these series of these books is that the ships have all ridiculous names. <laughs> so it's it's classic British humor in the end. Ian yeah. Banks is a Scottish author. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he died unfortunately from cancer a few years back. And then to conclude this uh, eccentric collection of books, I have I have to recommend the Malison book of the Fallen. It's more, it's of course the story and the world is great. But the sheer dedication of the author, and to be honest, it's two authors. So they, 20 years ago, they sat down. It's, it's a former archaeologist. He's, he's called uh, Stephen Erickson. Mm -hmm. And uh, I blank on his, on, on his colleague. But um, he sat down and he, in his mind, or he, he sketched out 10, ten volume story. 10 times 1,000 pages. Bam. And he managed to sell this before... The first book was probably even written. He managed to sell his idea to a publisher and he basically got, I think he got the advanced, the advance for the whole 10 books. And in the meantime, it's uh, 32 books <laughs> with small stories and side lines. And it's all, it's, how do you call it, describe it? It's, it's super high end fantasy slash sci fi archaeology. Mm -hmm. It basically plays in a fictional world, medieval times, but also a bit steampunky. Yeah, uh, it has magic in it. It's uh, it has multiverse aspects in it or parallel universe aspects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have <laughs> kind of this idea, this notion of the fundamental energies, fire, earth, and wind and all this stuff where then certain magicians can make you know use of these elements and open portal into other worlds there's dragons yeah which of re course represent <laughs> the we represent the, the the primal chaos energy i guess the fascinating part about this book it's absolutely impossible to explain and probably unfilmable <laughs> this is this is the ultimate yeah. challenge right yeah. yeah yeah i mean we thought we we thought too that Wheel of Time and Song of Ice and Fire are unfilmable and they do it. So probably I have to eat my words here. But <laughs> but if they ever try to film or visualize the Malison Book of the Fallen, I'm there. <laughs> 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 I wish them good luck. 
Oh, that's that's cool. So yeah, that's cool. this yeah. is. Um, I could probably go on. There's so many more things. I mean, or the world is another series of books, which is mm. great. Mm. Then uh, now I'm blank on the. There was recently a uh, this the VR movie. Uh, I've, uh, I just uh, Ready blanked. Player One. Yeah, exactly. That's a great book. Yeah, movie is uh, so la la, but the book is great. Ready Player One. I I also heard that. Is we talked about Mortal Engines before. These are great the, books too. The books yeah. are supposedly really f- fantastic. Yeah, I I really devoured them. Yeah, yeah. This I, is great, yeah. great stuff. Yeah, yeah. I could ramble on. My my God, there's so many things. Uh, like we can when when the podcast is released, like you can give me a whole list. We'll I'll add it in yeah. the description. <laughs> Wheel of Time is great to read. It's yeah. it's huge, <laughs> right? You have to really dedicate your time there. Yeah. Oh, and of course, Der Schwarm, The Swarm, from uh, Frank Schätzing, Biothriller. That's really entertaining as well. And kind of close to our climate catastrophe reality. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah it's about sharing the planet with nature and uh, all the things which go wrong when nature fights back <laughs> consciously. <laughs> so that's a really, really nice one. There's a one. teaser. <laughs> it, it has been... Uh, it has been made in, into a series as well. Yeah. By, uh, I think, it's BBC and German television. Meh. Yeah. <laughs> it's always hard. If as, you, as usual, right? If you see, the, if you see <laughs> films and series from your favorite books, which you read three times, it's always hard to. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so that's that's. Uh, I think I stop here. <laughs> Otherwise, this uh, <laughs> explodes. <laughs> yeah. So, second question: If you could change one thing on this planet to make it a better place, what would what would it be? I would like to change people's mindset that everybody needs to have its own car because, and especially, I would like to change the mindset that that people think when they buy an electric car they save the planet. Yeah, it's to think the time is just over for individual transport. It's too many people now. Yeah, I don't even go into stop war and stuff like that. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. But I yeah, think yeah. the transportation problem, that's the big one. Of course, it's naive as well, but <laughs> at least, uh, you know, sharing vehicles, it's a great thing. And uh, share economy in general, I like a lot. It would be great if people don't have to rely on individual cars or kind of, uh, you know, disproportionate resource consuming uh, ways of of transportation. Yeah, I mean, there's also your link to, for example, the fixing the bike community, uh, like service that you're involved. I know also in in other aspects of your life, you're actively engaged in, in such communities and so definitely yeah. see the the potential that when working together we as let's say as a society or as as humankind we could optimize a lot of things and it ties back into urban planning right we need of to course. make yeah. we need to make our centers of living get denser and denser and we need to we need to make sure that people feel safe to try to use alternative means of transportation which yeah or less uh, CO2, carbon dioxide emitting, these kind of things. Yeah. Gray energy. Of, yeah. uh, we talked about this also in construction of buildings. I mean, there's a huge potential, right? And I'm fully aware that we are living here in, uh, in the El Dorado in Switzerland. I mean, we are Switzerland is a big a big city with large parks, right? And great tram lines, yeah. Yeah. if yeah. we are honest. Yeah. Yeah. And we are absolutely in a luxury place here but in terms of mobility. But, uh, yeah. Considering the in the bigger picture, yeah, I absolutely uh, agree. And then just the last one: Who would you like to see as a guest on the Three D Environment podcast? I mean, uh, kind of two worlds, right? If I'm if I'm playing it really close to home, I'm, I guess Pascal would be a great guest, right? That's uh, I I heard this once or twice before, so I. I would be honored. Maybe one one day it it will happen. Or he has a little bit of time because I'm I'm. Uh, he really should tell his own story. I don't want to speak for him here, so yeah, that's yeah, really important. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, um, otherwise, yeah, maybe somebody from Veta would be cool. <laughs> I just had a few weeks back. So I'm still waiting for the audio to be processed. Uh, I had a recorded. Po- 
podcast that will be re released soon-ish uh, with uh, Chris White. Oh, perfect. Right, so so that Weta is kind of checked. Yeah, that's and, very nice. And actually, uh, I mean, he's, he's not with Weta anymore, of but course, upcoming but just... is is also Paolo Selva. He's now at, oh, yeah. at Scanline, right? Yeah, yeah. So these are also two of the people that I think would have been absolutely amazing to quote unquote land on the podcast. Uh, and so one is checked and the next one will actually be recorded next week. So and that's, maybe that's also fantastic. somebody who would be interesting is Jen Johnson. Could be interesting. She yeah. has a lot to yeah. tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her work at the UN is... Uh, yeah. She's now a member of the City Engine team. Yeah, I and, just uh, saw that she like just, a week uh, ago. She just she has so many stories to tell. She did so many great works in educating and yeah. also teaching. Yeah, that's a professional a, GIS and uh, some great uh, experience, I think, at the UN as well. So yeah, yeah, that's also that's a fantastic input because um, I mean this is the cool thing with 3D environments, right? You have and that's also kind of a little bit or the reason also for the podcast, but also for the ICE conference. Mm -hmm. Because I'm I'm interested in the dialogues with a lot of people that work in a lot of different industries. There are so many ties and discussions that are so interesting to dive into. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, whether this is concept art or or I don't know movie direction or try to reach out, I wasn't didn't succeed yet. Uh, music score in the context of film production couldn't reach out yet to a person that actually uh, was interested interested yet but maybe on right? simmer oh, no no not <laughs> yet um but uh, would also be interesting because it's it's all or with all of the senses creating these fantastic one often, worlds, one often right? underestimates the importance of the soundtrack yes yeah, i mean absolutely george lucas said that the score is 50 percent of the experience mm -hmm. in the cinema right or also the effect soundtrack yeah. You can uh, save a lot of scene work by you having yeah. audio effects. And yeah. it's just, it's yeah. fantastic, yeah. fascinating what you can yeah. do. And all of these things, I mean, uh, if you look at audio, audio has such a strong influence on, on your three-dimensional mm. perception of things. So that in itself is kind of, has a lot to do with world building in a literal three-dimensional uh, sense, mm. right? So... Yeah, no, I'm I'm really looking forward to kind of also exploring other, let's say, tracks or types of people. Of world builders. Of world of builders, because builders, there are so yeah. many aspects that I didn't think about it yet. And yeah, Jen, Jen might also be fantastic with, uh, yeah, with her work in the United Nations in the context of... Um, I, I mean, I'm not perfectly sure, but there's United Nations in the sense of What's what would that be called? Uh, like you mean, like like emergency services, yeah, so in terms of maps or 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 yeah, just in in general with with crisis management yeah. and and uh, respond disaster response exactly so. disaster disaster response um, mm. refugee site management and and so on and so on. There are many many different well, applications. The, the heavy topics, yeah, the hard yeah. stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, this has been fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so I was, much. Uh, I was really uh, nicely surprised. I was when you asked me to come here. I, I didn't really expect that. So uh, no, great. no, it's it's, <laughs> it's 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 very cool. And also, yeah, thank you so much for even coming to the office. It's it's been an honor. In Switzerland, everything is near, <laughs> and I assume you use public transport. Yes, of course. <laughs> I mean. Who is so crazy to try to go with a car somewhere in Zurich in Russia? <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. No, thank you again so much for doing this. And yeah, I would say let's slowly wrap it up. Any last comments, thoughts, suggestions? No. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, now I'm hungry. <laughs> uh, yep. Same here. Same here. Let's go for dinner. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs>